I'd hoped to have Paul Nurath, who was one of my mentors and, and one of the uh, real pioneers in the game business, who's still active and, and uh, more than relevant today on here. Maybe we'll get him in later in the semester, but uh, unfortunately he had a family emergency, so he had to leave. And uh, uh, his, his partner, Matthew Bellows, is the general manager of uh, Paul's new company, Floodgate, uh, graciously st agreed to step in and, and uh, fill the gap for us. So uh, he's going to talk for uh, as long as he can off the top of his head, basically, uh, about Floodgate, about, about the, uh, the different kinds of games they've done, um, and about uh, building teams and putting together pitches and, and building projects of very varied sorts. Um, ask him lots of questions when you're done, because the more questions you ask, the less you have to listen to me after he's done. Because uh, I have I have whipped out a uh, a backup lecture that I hope will be relevant and interesting, but uh, the longer he talks, the less I do. Okay, so uh, here you go, Matthew Bellows, he's general manager of Floodgate Entertainment. Thanks, Warren. So, uh, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here, even though it's a short notice. Um, uh, Maybe a little bit about just kind of my background and how I got into the games industry in general. Um, I, like many people in the games industry, started as a tester, uh, but way back in the day when I was in high school, I was a tester for Infocom games, um, the text adventure games. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a dream job for a high school kid. And I started as an outside tester and then worked there for summers and, and uh, kind of got to know what it takes to be a tester. Um, and then uh, kind of lost my way a little bit and ended up in, you know, telecoms and call center software and, and things like that. And I got an MBA. And so I'm definitely on the suit side of things as opposed to the ponytail side of things. Um, and, uh, and I still kind of, I would go to these conferences and I'd go to these different uh, trade shows and sit in there and, you know, listen to people talk about, you know, SS7 signaling technologies and stuff like that. And I was just like, you know what? I might be making money at this, but it's just not where my heart is at, you know, like, but being an MBA, of course, I needed to do like the standard opportunity analysis to think like, okay, you know, what can I do and how can this all kind of come together such that I can get back into the games world because it's really the nexus, as, as you know, of being in Warren's class, uh, nexus of really, really smart people, really recreative people, and kind of this open-ended opportunity. I mean, it, w the games industry right now is like, the movie industry when Buster Keaton was making movies, right? There's a sense that this could be big. There's a sense that people are really taking off and, and trying new things, but there's not at all, a, uh, there's a sort of a sense of potential. But there's not at all a sense of like, we are here, right? There's no, the established companies and even the biggest companies that are in this world are still trying to figure out, you know, kind of what they're going to be when they grow up and, and what this medium will be for people, you know, in the next, 20, 50, 100 years. And so I really felt like that was something I wanted to be a part of. And so um, I, I started a company called WGR Media, which was a, an on, a website, online publication that reviewed video games uh, specifically for cell phones. And my sort of, you know, my, the reason why I entered there is because there was no one really doing that. There was no one really reviewing these games from a gamer point of view. And there was a tremendous need for the people who are making these things, you know, and by that I mean the developers and the publishers and the carriers to get the word out to people. And so my uh, website became sort of the neutral meeting place where everybody in the, in the industry, in the sort of emerging industry in 2001, 2002, 2003 could kind of come and find a neutral meeting place and hear what an objective third party, that my company, thought of what they were doing. And so, um, I knew I had it made, basically. I, I interviewed the VP of data for Sprint uh, in CES 2002, January 2002. And I knew I had it made when I posted his interview on the site. And I got a phone call, and I picked it up, and I was like, yo, what's with the fucking Sprint interview? You know, interview me. And I'm like, all right, who are you? You know, it's like, I, I run data for Verizon. And I'm like, all right, I'll interview you. And so it just kind of, kind of pieced together this sort of community of, uh, of people who were interested in seeing games take off on cell phones. And um, through that process, then I, I, I grew that company and did a deal with Ziff Davis to get our content into Computer Gaming World and Electronic Gaming Monthly and sold content to Yahoo and uh, AT&T. And we got on the Sprint 
mobile you know, download site, the DEC, um, where we would uh, review their games and give people an easy link to buy the games that we thought were good. Um, and then we sold that company to CNET and became the mobile section of GameSpot. So for a little while kind of merged the up and coming video game on a phone world with the core GameSpot reader, right, which is all about what's up and coming on PCs and consoles. Um, I left that after about a year at CNET having transferred all my people out to San Francisco and given them all my sales contacts and everything like that and joined Paul Nurath at Floodgate um, because I really wanted to know what it took to make a game, like, like actually from a technical standpoint, from a business standpoint, what did it actually take to make a video game? And um, as, as Warren has said, you know, in terms of the kind of opportunities that I had to learn, to learn from Paul, it's been a great experience. Um, and I do now know what it takes to make a video game, at least on a small scale. The projects that we work on are cell phone games, PDA games, and a couple PC games. And I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of the different ones to give you guys, hopefully, a, a sense of the business constraints associated with a creative project like a video game, and then the challenges and opportunities associated with kind of navigating that water, right? Because everyone's got a creative vision, or everyone in this class has a creative vision of what they want to build, or maybe you're kind of coming to what I want to build. And that has a lot to do with what you like, what you think is cool, what you think you know, other people would like, what your friends would like. Um, but there's another uh, kind of vector to consider when you're thinking about your projects, which is basically what, what are the impacts of the, the platform choice I make? What are the impacts from the team perspective, from the financing perspective? from the customer perspective, from the technology underpinning perspective, what can I do in that medium? Um, and so, you know, my, my take on this is sort of like, you know, artist, video game artist as entrepreneur and business guy as video game artist and kind of where those, those intersect. Um, and, and for most, uh, in, in, in a lot of the literature, uh, that's strictly a game design literature, there's not as much consideration of the constraints and opportunities associated with channel selection, customer choice, and, and, um, and platform selection. So hopefully, you know, in a couple minutes, I can just survey some of those issues, and, um, and you can take that as input into the kind of uh, pitch documents that you guys are going to be building. So we do a whole bunch of different kind of games. Um, we do, like I said, cell phone games. Um, we do uh, PC games. Uh, this, this game, Daycare Nightmare, is our latest release. And it's a download uh, from the major game portals kind of package. Um, this, this game itself is 28 megabytes. It goes up on, we launched on you know, games.yahoo.com. We had an exclusive with them for two weeks. And then it rolled out to all the other distribution sites like Big Fish and Play First and iWin and the Oberon Network and all these other sort of distribution outlets. Um, and then people download the demo. They play it for 60 minutes. At the end of 60 minutes, they decide, do I want to buy it or not? If they want to buy it, they enter their credit card number and you know, uh, 1995 or 1495 gets charged to their account. Um, that then goes to the distribution company and then they pay us, the developer, a net, you know, a, a revenue share basically on that. And that revenue share is, you know, roughly 40% of what the distribution company brings in. Um, ha has anybody here looked at casual game economics or casual game distribution opportunities at all? Okay, so, so um, the good thing about this kind of approach, you know, from, a, from an opportunity to create entertainment for people, is that it's very open. As long as your game fits within a generally prescribed audience type, i.e., you know, the, the stereotype is, you know, uh, moms aged 35 to 45, um, but it's really like moms and their kids who play these kind of games. And these games range from, you know, Bejeweled to, uh, you know, um, Diner Dash to Cake Mania to you know, kind of hunting games where, like in Myst, where you're looking around for a hidden object, or you're trying to solve very basic puzzles, kind of point and click kind of games, um, to games like Daycare Nightmare, which are 
at the core level of gameplay, a very a, a very much sort of like a time management kind of game, like Root Beer Tapper was, or Diner Dash is, right? You have lots of stuff to deal with, and you have to manage the chaos in your environment. So the, the fiction behind this game is that you, um, you discover that monsters live among us. And monsters discover that you discovered the monsters live among us. And so, of course, they say, I'm sorry, but I have to eat you. And then the monster gets a cell phone call, and the monster says, I've got to go to the office right now. If you can take care of my kid for the day, maybe at the end of the day I won't eat you. And so you start out uh, opening a daycare center for monsters. And the little babies get dropped off at your house. And you know the first one is this pink blob baby, you know, kind of like Cartman-esque kind of blob baby. Um, and then there are more different kind of babies that get dropped off, and they all have different personalities. Uh, so the, the vampire baby, if you don't take care of their need, if you don't change their diaper or put them in the playpen uh, quickly enough, he bites you in the neck and slows you down. You know, or the dragon like breathes fire and hurts babies around him, so you have to go to the first aid station and patch them up. Um, and, and so it's a familiar game mechanic for people, and the innovation on, on the creative side for us was really about kind of pushing the edge and making content a little bit darker, but not too dark, you know, and a little bit more, uh, a little bit more visceral, you know, and also a little sense of humor, you know, that you don't actually find in, in a lot of these games. Um, so the, uh, so this has been our last game, and the, and the, the state where it's at right now is on these sites, it's done, done pretty well on these different sites. We've now had it translated into German, French, Italian, and Spanish. Um, it's live in Germany. It's coming out for the other eFix languages you know, in the next month or so. And we just signed a retail distribution deal to get it into boxes sort of for the you know, Q1, you know, January kind of time frame for a release. Um, so that's the, that's the most recent game that we've done. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean multiplayer was the was the, you know, uh, the the previous game. Uh, we released this game uh, in time for the second movie with Verizon, exclusive with Verizon, and then for the third movie, cross carrier on Sprint, Singular, and Verizon. Um, for this game, Disney was the publisher and marketer, and we were the developer. Um, interesting thing. I mean, this game is it's basically Counter-Strike on your cell phone, right? So you play in up to uh, 8v8 games on your phone. It's a real-time action game. Um, you instance off into 30 maps. There are three different kinds of gameplay. There's, you know, capture the flag, there's deathmatch, and there's like an offense-defense kind of game. Um, we support, you know, uh, real-time chat. We support teams. We support guilds. We support sort of a leveling uh, dynamic, so there's some persistence in the world where if you play really well on a particular map, your guild can own that map, and then guilds can challenge other guilds' ownerships of maps, and if you own a map, you get a boon for being on that map, but other people are incentivized to take you down. Um, it's a very, it's, it's, to my knowledge, the most ambitious cell phone game, uh, certainly in the, in the Western Hemisphere, um, in terms of the technology behind it, in terms of the gameplay that's, that's been, uh, sort of built behind it, and the community features, which we really, really worked hard on. Um, fully networked games, so you can't play when you're offline. Uh, kind of a core game mechanic. So, you know, I think if we were to do this again, we would make it much less of a core experience and much more of a, you know, casual game, because cell phone gamers are more casual. But this is the kind of thing, and this is, the, this is the, always the, the fight, right, is like you have a vision of what you want to build, and then to what extent, to how much extent can you bring in the dynamics of the people that you're actually going to be putting this game in front of? You know, and I think in this case, you know, in, in Daycare Nightmare, we pretty much hit it right on, right? It was a little bit edgy, but not too edgy for the market. Um, in Pirates of the Caribbean, it was like technically way beyond what was ever, whatever was out there, but the core gameplay mechanic was probably too core for the people who actually you know, for most of the people who play it. Now, people who play it, find it, stick with it, subscribe to it, you know, play it over and over again, are obsessed with it and they play it all the time. But, you know, there's this sort of back and forth about, here's my vision, you know, does it match the channels that I'm pushing it out through? Um, 
Uh, Daycare Nightmare was a game that we funded ourselves. So another thing worth considering, certainly when you're going out to pitch your project, is who's going to pay for it to be built. And you know, you could think about paying for it in terms of cash to pay the people that are going to work on your team. We could think about how you're going to spend your, you know, friendship capital to ask friends to work late at night or do a second project or, or whatever. All those kind of currencies, you know, you're going to have to basically bring to bear and squeeze every last drop of uh, effectiveness out of because there's no easy way to do a video game and all of it is going to push everybody as far as you can. And so, you know, you have to figure out like, like, because we can pay salaries at Floodgate, I don't have to call on so many favors, or at least I call on different kinds of favors for friends. But um, it's definitely going to be a consideration when you go and say, when someone says, hey, that's a great pitch, awesome pitch, how much money do you need to build it? You know, when can you have it done for me? So we, we paid for Daycare Nightmare, and by doing that ourselves, we are able to create exactly the kind of game that we wanted and we thought would be appropriate for the kind of creative vision and the market that we were serving. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean, we uh, created the game itself and Disney was the distribution, so it was almost like a joint venture where we invested a lot of money into it, they invested a lot of time, effort, and the brand, and certainly money to test it and put it out in the marketplace, and then we do a rev share on, on the back end. Um, so two different kind of models. Um, the basic underlying approach with those kind of models is that the more you as the game developer, the more progress you can make as the game developer, the more you're going to own. And the more you own, the more of the revenue that you can claim as yours. Um, and, you know, and it's not just about making money at it, it's about claiming it as yours in terms of the underlying assets of the game, the technology IP, the brand IP, and most importantly probably, um, the ownership that you have of the product, right? So there, there's you know, legions of examples of people who have signed up, you know, a big publisher to fund their dream game, and then the publisher's like, okay, great. Well, we love your prototype. We're gonna, you know, send our producers over there, and we'll probably send a couple artists over there, and they're gonna work in your studio, and they're gonna help us implement the game that we think your game should be, right? And it's very gratifying to see your game finally get to the shelf, but you also have to wonder, like, is that really my game? You know. So uh, with this kind of with this kind of model, where we finance this game, we could build exactly the kind of thing that we wanted, as long as Disney signed off on it, and there were legions of people signing off on all the creative associated with Pirates of the Caribbean. But at least we could we could go that far. Um, but that is not at all the standard model for doing console games, PC games, or even cell phone games at this point. Uh, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic uh, was co-developed with a French studio called Arcane and published by Ubisoft, and this came out October of last year. Um, and this was, again, an innovative kind of approach to first-person RPG kind of world, right? And uh, we basically worked on a lot of the overall concept, story arc, um, and then delve down into the level design, sound design, character design kind of stuff. And then Arcane had the programmers and the artists who actually made that thing real, right? And they were very heavily influenced by Ubisoft, who you know, wanted to really put their mark on, on this game. Um, so that's another kind of approach where you could team up with another team. Maybe you bring a creative vision and a, a view for how this can be brought to market. And the developer studio says, we have the technical resources and the technology infrastructure required to actually make this thing alive. And then the publisher will come in and say, we can help bring it to market. We can give you money for it. We can you know, sell it. We can bring it to the ch retail channels. Um, this, is a, this was a shrink wrap. Anybody play Dark Messiah of Might and Magic? Yeah. So uh, it did pretty well. It wasn't like a smash hit or anything, but it, it was a shrink wrap, you know, box that you bought in a store for 40 or 50 bucks and you played it. There was a great online component and there's a big single player mission kind of thing. Um, uh, but sort of a different way of bringing a creative vision to, to, to market. Mopets um, is a game that's right now live on Singular and uh, is coming to Verizon and Sprint, you know, 
shortly, like in the next two weeks, as uh, as, as Sony keeps saying to us. Um, but it's a game that um, that is it's a Tamagotchi style game, right? Raise your adopt a pet, adopt a cat, dog, a ferret, a monkey. Um, through a series of mini games, teach them new tricks. Um, you know, walk them around, um, and then when they get ready, take them to the talent show. And I don't know if you guys ever heard of the Muppet Show, but in the Muppet Show, which is an old, you know Jim Henson uh, vehicle, uh, there are these two guys who sit in the sit in the balcony called Statler and Waldorf, and they basically make you know disparaging comments about the people who are down on stage. So we have like we have Casey and Andy who in the talent show you know criticize and joke about your pet's performance in the talent show, but but you're basically uh, kind of in a chess ladder kind of style, trying to bring your pet up to the top of the rank in a head-to-head -head, uh, style gameplay online within your mobile phone. Um, this this was a, from a business standpoint, uh, a game that we partnered very closely with Sony BMG for financing for the game, for distribution of the game, um, and, and marketing of the game. But again, because we invested our own money and our own creative vision into it. We own uh, all the IP associated with it, and also a big share of the revenue that comes back from the sale of the game. Again, not not typically the standard video game model, but it kind of gets to the question of like, how? What are the business components of associated with how you're going to bring bring your stuff to market, and what are the choices that you've got uh, available to you? Uh, NASCAR 07 um, is an EA sports game, big brand. Uh, we launched this last February uh, in time for the NASCAR season. Um, it's a cell phone game that runs on you know, 3D hardware accelerated phones, so phones that can do 3D within software only, so they don't have special chips, but you can still render 3D, and also 2D uh, cell phones. So it, it covers the very highest end of cell phones and also kind of the Midland low tier of cell phones, um, and this game is really a traditional kind of video game model, right? EA came to us and said, "We got the NASCAR brand. What would you guys do with it? How would you make a game for cell phones that's about you know turning left, driving a car?" Um, so, what we did here from a creative standpoint was looked at all the racing games that are out there, and there's dozens and dozens of racing games for cell phones, and they all end up being like a total button mashing, hand cramping, you know, uh, you know, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome inducing, you know, steering kind of game. <coughs> and we said, NASCAR is actually much more of a tactical experience, and people who actually follow NASCAR are much more interested in the tactical choices that each driver makes. So it's not so much about moving quickly from lane to lane, but when you move, when you draft, when you decide to pass, who you work with and who you don't work with. And there's a whole sort of soap opera element of it that takes place between races, like who bumped who, who, uh, you know, who hated who last week, you know, that kind of stuff. Who's dating whose girlfriend now, that kind of stuff. And so this game was a, a very a tactical racing game. So you, you, you can almost, at the, at the basic level, level one starting right off, you can come in first, second, or third without ever touching a button. And that was a design con constraint that EA put on us to say, this is a casual market. We want it to be dead easy for someone to very quickly come in and do OK without really even knowing how the game works. Um, but there are sort of unveiling levels of complexity associated with it such that when you actually pay attention and try to figure out the tactics, you can actually do better and better on more difficult uh, courses and more difficult levels. Um, so it's really all about you know, clicking left to switch lanes, to get in behind somebody. There's a little draft meter you can see um, on, on the right-hand side of the screen at the very top. And that sort of fills up as you, as you draft more. You get more kind of draft boost. And then when it's full, you can swing out and blow by somebody and then pull in behind somebody else. And that's kind of how you pass. So it's, a, it's sort of a you know, press to the right place, wait for the right moment, press to switch, press to accelerate, pull in, and you kind of step your way, almost like a, like a real-time checkers game in some ways. Um, so, and, and like I said, this is, a, this is kind of the typical kind of game that a studio would do for a publisher, right? Where they basically say, here's what we've got. What do you do with it? 
And when they're doing that, they're obviously, anybody work in the video game industry here besides Warren? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, you do? We were both interns. Okay, all right, so you know, for who? Amaze. Amaze, is that a developer? Yeah, so, so, so you know that basically when a, when a publisher comes to you and says, we've got this brand, what would you do with it? They're also having those similar conversations with five or six other people, right? And, and they're gonna ask you to submit a pitch document and come and do a meeting or do a phone call at the very least and walk through why you think you can do the best NASCAR game. And then at the end of it, they're gonna say, wow, that's really awesome, incredible work, great concept art, we really buy into your creative vision for what this can be. Um, how much is it gonna cost? When can you deliver it? And uh, you know, you're basically like, uh, well, you know, what's the budget? And they're like, well, why don't you just tell us what you need? And then so you're like, well, you know, this game is, uh, you know, for all these different phones um, across two different operating systems, right, Java and Brew, it's like programming Java, programming C, um, for, you know, a whole range of, of platforms. This is a $700,000 game. And they're like, mm, actually, I've got some guys in Croatia here who can probably do this thing for $200,000. You know, and we're like, well, maybe we could do it for $500,000. You know, and it's like, it's like that. And you're lucky if you can get the call back you know, they really, really like you if they get the call back to say, actually, the budget's a little high on that. Can you come down a little bit and can you work with us on that? Because we really want to work with you. Most of the time what happens is when you pitch a document and your budget's too high, they're just like, they don't call you back and you never hear from them again. Even if they're friends of yours, you know, like these are friends of mine and I'm like, so whatever happened to that thing we pitched you? And they're like, oh yeah, um, we didn't get the rights to it or we found somebody else or whatever. So. There's a sense of like uh, continual low-level frustration that I think is very much akin to what any kind of creative artist experiences in a job or a profession or when they're trying to bring, you know, they're trying to bring their music out. They're trying to bring their paintings out in the studio. They're trying to, my brother's a writer, right? He's trying to get his book done. Um, who's going to publish it, you know? And, and, and there's this continual sense of, low-level frustration of they don't see my vision or they won't pay me to execute my vision you know, to the extent I want. And, um, and that's basically like just part of it. It's like a, an ongoing gut check uh, in, 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 in the video game world. And um, you know, I, I feel like if I'm not feeling physical pain at least one day a week you know, from this process, then I'm doing something wrong because it's gotta hurt, you know, and that's the only way that like you'll mo motivate to actually move on to the, to the, next, uh, to the next pitch, basically. Um, pitching is tough, we could have a whole, like, you could probably do a whole master class on pitching, right? <laughs> but it's absolutely the most essential thing. Um, well, not the most essential thing, but it's, it's right up there. You know, and, and the goal obviously is to get to a point with your personal career and your studio where you walk in and they're like, what you did last title was freaking amazing. Like just unbelievable, you know? And we just wanna, we wanna option your ideas, you know? We'll write you a check right now such that we get first look at whatever you do. Um, just like in the movie industry, that's kind of like it. Executive producers know they've reached it when you know, Paramount says that to them, we'll option your ideas. Um, but, but, you know, there are very, there are three, four, five, six studios in, in the U.S. that actually have that kind of level of success. And coming out of college, no matter how good this program is, you're not going to have that, right? So it's all about, like, how do you, how do you move yourself kind of from a career perspective, but also from a creative vision perspective towards that you know, level of being able to express your creative vision uh, to the extent that you want. Um, and it's really, I think it's a life's work. I mean, I think it, you, you'd know better than I would. Um, we started out, um, uh, we started out, Floodgate started out and in, in, in previous uh, studio called Looking Glass Studio, Paul started out doing PC games, and these were, uh, you know, very well-respected, critically acclaimed, and sent some best-selling titles um, like Thief and System Shock and, uh, you know, 
amazing flight simulators and uh, very technically challenging projects um, that Paul and Warren worked on together. Um, and, and even then, right, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, the, it's like the musicians say, you're only as good as your last album. Right, so you just got to keep working it, and and so the first game that that Floodgate did was um, Neverwinter Nights: Shadows of Undertide, which was a follow-up to Neverwinter Nights, and Floodgate was before I came to Floodgate, but uh, worked very closely with Bioware, and Atari was the publisher here. So in this case, it was kind of a work-for-hire job that Atari was paying for, and Bioware were the people signing off and saying, "We have creative rights. We have immediate, like yes or no." all the time uh, for whatever you do. And this game ended up doing very, very well um, on the PC side. Um, but again, you know, the, the, the benefit that accrues to a studio for doing a particular project like this is, you know, hopefully enough money to pay the bills and, uh, and maybe enough money to bonus people out for doing a great job and crunching for 80 hours a week for the last, you know, two or three months um, or sometimes more. Um, but also the ability to say we created this thing, and and you can always go on Moby Games and say like, look, this is you know this is my this is my career writ large. These are the things I've created. Um, so, um, so you can see I think that there's a variety of options um, in terms of you know ways and channels to take your creative vision uh, to to market and. Beyond your artistic vision, there are real business realities or business implications, business constraints behind the choices that you make. And in some ways, um, you know, it gets a bad rap in the industry because it's definitely not the sexiest thing to think about. On the other hand, I feel like there's a real opportunity for innovation and creativity on the business side. So um, when you think about your projects, you know, Think not only about the kind of great uh, entertainment experience you want to make or emotional connection you want to make with your players, but think about how are the ways that you can bring this to market with the resources that you have at your disposal, right? And that's where the real entrepreneurship comes in. You know, that's where the real opportunity for creativity comes in on the business side. So um, I think it always starts with who you are, you know, as a person, as an artist, as a as uh, someone who's going to run the startup gauntlet. Um, but it has to also be um, you know, driven by these other real world constraints. And so you can, you can be very firm about who you are. You can die for your artistic vision. You can you know, starve in the studio uh, to get this thing done. Um, you, can, you can ask all your friends to stay late every single weekend you know, for the next year and you can call in all the favors you can possibly think of to see your dream realized, or you can be more flexible and try to think, hey, that's not working. How can I respond to that? Can I take it to a new, uh, a new market? And I think the, the, um, the lesson that we had with uh, Daycare Nightmare was really like, it was a response to what we learned from Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Which is that the cell phone world is the most convoluted, messed up, you know, distribution channel in the world, and fully one half of the resources behind making that cell phone game went into QA and test and porting, you know, to support all the different handsets out there. So, you know, we really had this firm conviction that we we're going to make this, you know, the first real MMO for cell phones, the first real real time action game for cell phones. And, uh, and you can only hold on so tightly to that for so long before you realize, hey, you know, this isn't working. You know, what, what else can we do? What else can we iterate on? And, um, and so we've chosen to be somewhat loose in terms of who Floodgate is as a studio. Are we in a particular genre? Not really. You know, are we on a platform that we're expert at? Well, we have built up core technologies that enable us to address different platforms pretty well, but we're not married to anyone, you know? Um, uh, and to some extent, that's driven by the fact that we haven't had like a billion selling game yet on a particular platform. If we were, you know, we'd be like, we're fully an Xbox 360 studio and that's all we'll ever do, you know. Um, but as, as you've seen from recent events, right, there, there, there's uh, constraints associated with that, right? And Bungie was like, hey, you know, working with Microsoft is great, but what's up with the Wii, you know? How are we ever going to, 
what's, what's going on there? You know, is there an outlet for some other creative impulses that we have in that platform? You know, so we've chosen to be more open in terms of the channels that we can take a creative vision to. Um, and then there's always the moment of just jumping in, basically. And you're just like, OK, I've thought about it. I've planned it. I've talked to my team. We have a shared vision, or we have a, we have a sort of a consensus, or at least people have agreed not to disagree anymore, and we're going to go for it. And then you just plunge into that process for however long it takes. You know, and it could be a month, or three months, or six months, or a year uh, of struggling to get your thing done. Um, and then you kind of emerge out of that, and you're like, post-mortem. You know? How did that go? Is our bank account more full or less full? <laughs> Can we do that again? No? Well, what else should we do? You know? um, so you really, it, it behooves you to understand the, all the implications associated with a particular project that you choose, especially at this point, right? Because right now it's a thought exercise, right? For you guys, you're at this great step, stage where you can actually just step back and be like, hmm. What do I want to do? How could I do it? How could I pull together? What are the resources required? So just to give you some resource required number for each of these projects, uh, Daycare Nightmare, about $150,000 to build. Um, it was a full-time developer, you know, engineer, um, full-time artist, maybe one and a half artists, um, a designer, and a part-time producer. Um, to make this 30 meg game, basically. And um, six months from start to finish kind of thing. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, closer to north of half a million dollars to build. Um, uh, you know, and this was multiple engineers, a server programmer, a couple client side programmers, a Java guy, a handset guy, a porting person, QA, you know, all that stuff massive producer overload in terms of working with Disney and making sure everything got signed off on time uh, to make this movie date, which is, you know, if you can avoid signing up for a movie date release, I would highly recommend sign <laughs> not signing up for a movie date release. It's a freaking nightmare. Um, and then, like, okay, so, so with this game, right, we cranked <coughs> to get this thing out cross-carrier, Sprint, Verizon, Singular, on, you know, 30, 40 handsets per carrier through all their test and certification procedures. And then the third movie came out, and like it did really well on the movie, you know, but it's not the cultural phenomenon that number two was, right? You don't see kids dressed up in pirate costumes anymore, right? It's sort of like two was definitely the peak of the sort of cultural gestalt of the game. So you kind of tie your, your success with it. I don't know, maybe some of you still talk like a pirate in certain days, but like <laughs> it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a big thing. Um, uh, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic was multiple millions of dollars. Ubisoft paid for everything. So luckily we didn't have to fund that. <laughs> uh, Mopets was uh, probably on the order of $250,000 to build. Uh, EA Sports, this is a, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mostly, again, taken up by porting and supporting all the different devices that we have to do once we have the core design and the assets built. But this is basically designing a 2D game and a 3D game and all the assets associated with it. So fairly challenging project. But single player only, no networking, no multiplayer. Um, so uh, there are obviously different implications um, can I just get a show of hands about people who are thinking about you know, their project as being like a hardcore game? This is a PC or a console game that will be sold in stores. First person shooter, re you know, StarCraft, WarCraft, appeals to the people. You want, your dream would be to wake up and see it reviewed in Electronic Gaming Monthly. You'd love to see it and yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many people? Yeah, so, so you're signing up for a process that will take about a year to pitch after your document is done. It will likely not be signed until you have some kind of working prototype. Um, and that would include you know, real gameplay mechanics, real you know, one-level design, real stuff that people can play and get their hands on. Um, that's just basically, I mean, unless, unless you're you know, unless you're Warren or, uh, or extremely lucky or, you know, you can self-finance 
to get to a point where you can release it. Um, PC download world, anybody thinking about selling a game through Play First? Casual games? It's not sexy. Good thing about PC games, and this is what it, this is what all these portals told me, and this is what we found out, is they basically said, Daycare Nightmare, never heard of it. Is it a brand? No, it's not a brand. Is it a movie? No, it's not a movie. It's brand new. We just made it up. We think it'll be great. Hmm, plays pretty well. Familiar game mechanic. Interesting. Yeah, we'll throw it up there. We'll put it up for a day. We'll put it up for two days. We'll see what see see how our users respond, right? And so what they do is they basically say the strongest survives, and uh, we'll give you two days. We we launched on Yahoo Games for two weeks exclusive. We had all this marketing associated with it. They gave us to give their game, you know, to them exclusively for two weeks, and they promoted it to their user base, and then it went out on Big Fish and Play First, and and these are absolutely Darwinian kind of uh, marketplace. Whoever downloads it, then they play it, then they look at the conversion rate from downloads to purchases, and if you're north of 2%, they love it, and they'll put it up again. And if you're south of 2%, they'll be like, okay, fine, done, next. And Big Fish is like a game a day. Every day. And they get people to come because people always want a fresh experience, and they'll churn through this stuff very, very rapidly. And you've got one, two, three days to make an impression on people and grab them and make them want to buy that game and then make them want to tell their friends and then maybe it goes up to the top 10 and if it's a top 10 then it has some life and then the next portal picks it up and, and so on and so on. Uh, mobile games. People think about mobile, making a mobile game. Why not? It? <laughs> After that little <laughs> introduction to how wonderful it is. Why not? Yeah. In terms of creating one game to run across all the handsets? It's just kind of a development quagmire. It is a total development quagmire. Um, we, I mean, we, we, you know, we, our bread and butter is making mobile phone games, and it's only really doable because we've done it for f three or four years, and we have a technology infrastructure that enables us to prototype rapidly and port relatively painlessly. But it's, a, it's an awful market, and it's really painful for me personally to see that happening because you know, I kind of came to it you know, with my previous job thinking, like, it's open. It's free. We can see creativity. Everyone's got a handset. You know, it's new. People will try new things and stuff like that. And basically what happened is that the carriers clamped down so tight on the retail experience that unless you were one of the 5 or 10 or 15 established customers, companies distributing content through the carriers, you're not going to get a game on their deck. And even if you do get a game on their deck, it's going to be you know, on page 7 of the WAP menu kind of thing, and it's, the retail experience is awful. So it's really frustrating to me that, that mobile download games are so tightly constrained right now, and I think that's a major reason why, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but I certainly felt that there was a lot more from the ground up energy you know, coming out of mobile game innovation uh, two, three, four years ago than there is now because it sort of reached a plateau where people are satisfied with their Bejeweled or their Tetris or their bowling. Um, and there's not a lot of movement in terms of creating new experiences. Yes? Is it, isn't there a lot of movement in, in the Asian countries now? Like it's, it's big, big time in Japan and Korea, isn't it? Uh, yes. In some ways it is. And, and in some ways, you know, you could look at Japan and the mobile world there as a much more egalitarian model a la you know, download of web games in the U.S. Um, because pretty much anyone can distribute a game through a website on the major Japanese carriers. Um, but it's increasingly becoming more constrained because there's only so much time that people will have to spend on these things. Consumers will have to spend on these things. So while there can be a much broader range of like word of mouth marketing about something hot, it's not even now as innovative uh, a kind of place as as we all kind of thought it would be, even in, even in Japan and Korea. I mean, Korea is like it, it's you know worldwide a billion plus dollars in mobile game sales you know last year, um, and Korea and Japan are easily half of that. But um, you know, for me personally, you know, it's kind of interesting to see what they're doing there. But it's sort of also irrelevant because like. Me bringing my mobile game to you know KTF and NTT Docomo is sort of like you know two worlds colliding, and it's very hard to cross distribute content there. Now, Daycare Nightmare, for example, is being translated and ported to 
uh, set-top boxes that will be installed in Japanese and Korean hotel rooms. And th this company has taken the game for free, took the source codes, rewriting it for this new platform, and they're going to put it up in uh, Japan and Korea. You know, but it's uh, it's just so much less work to port to one set-top box than it is to support all the different handsets that are available in those other countries. Yeah. There was a question back there, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts with regards to the viability of that in the marketplace, and are those going to, do you, do you see that as something that's going to die out, or is it going to actually grow? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, Mopets was um, originally designed to be a GPS game. We, um, we actually were a member, I suppose we technically are still a member of the Verizon Pioneer program, which was the you know, initial phase of application developers building GPS-enabled applications. And the concept here was that when you, you choose your pet, and then it says, you know, what's my name? And then you give it a name, and then it says, where am I? Or tell me when we're home. And so when you get to your home, you say, okay, we're home, and that pops up the home environment. You know? And then it says, tell me when we get to your school. And that would pop up a school environment. And it sets up it would have set up these virtual fences, geofences they're called, which is you know a 50 meter radius around the place where you designate as your home, and your work, and your school, and the mall, um, and the park. You know, and so when you're physically in those places, you, the player, your pet is also in those places as well using LBS, location-based services. Um, Unfortunately, uh, you know, there, there are just far, far too few phones that are actually GPS enabled, um, at, at least for the time frame that we were on with this project, to make building in those features and supporting that new technology, um, you know, we, we couldn't imagine that we would actually get paid back for that kind of level of technical investment. I, it's, it's incredibly interesting. To me, it's the single major differentiator between cell phone games and any other form of game, except maybe the DS with the Wi-Fi connection, you know, the ability to link where the physical player is with a larger game world or a virtual game world. Um, but, um, and there are some experiments even in the U.S. that are sort of playing with those kind of issues. But um, for it to be a real mass market thing, I, I, I can't imagine it actually uh, being successful because even if you have, let's say you bought a phone a Verizon phone in the last year, and you've got GPS enabled, and you've got a game that takes advantage of it, and it's really awesome. You're going to tell your friend, you know, uh, chances are are one in three that someone else will be a Verizon customer, and then you know, chances are less that they'll have a GPS enabled phone, and then they have to go and find that game on the on the deck, you know, in the retail experience, you know, scrolling down through all the text links. Uh, so there's all these barriers associated with word of mouth marketing word of mouth you know sharing the buzz of something so i'm i'm uh, we're we're just you know something drastic needs to change in the mobile world to make uh mobile games actually a vibrant you know innovative medium and be able to you know sustain itself so the the thing i'll just leave you with um is is sort of obvious uh, but it's it's the web um and uh this is obviously the most open the most innovative, the most interesting, the most accessible from a developer point of view. Uh, and there is tons and tons of stuff happening on building web games, right? And these are anything from, you know, have a hotel to, you know, Gaia Online to, you know, Bang Howdy and, and other, you know, pi Puzzle Pirates, games like that, that are either in, like literally in a browser experience, like barely even a separate game world like Gaia is, or you know, instancing into a game world, but it's not even a download. It's just played through a browser and streamed from a server all the time. Um, and this is the place where I think there's the most opportunity for innovation and consequently also the least sort of set ways to make money. So no one really knows, like, is this, you know, million dollar experiment going to pay off? Is anyone going to play this thing? But people are throwing tons of money at it, so consequently, there's you know 30 or 40 projects right now that are casual MMOs. You know, that's the you know casual MMO, casual MMO, uh, World of Warcraft made accessible, uh, Flickr plus Facebook plus you know uh, you know World of Warcraft, like that's what we want. You know, and um, it's interesting, um, but again, 
uh, because of the competition, because so many people are thinking about it and the money is coming in to fund these projects, there's just, you know, there's a big hurdle to actually getting this thing built. So I, I think the most interesting thing, um, you know, if I was in your shoes, the, the places that I would look would be, you know, these tiny little web games, flash games, proving a game mechanic, proving a, a social media, proving uh, the addictiveness of a particular style or a particular hook into someone's emotional life, and then what can, how can I quickly prototype that on, on a web page, you know? Um, and so you look at a game like Line Rider, you know, um, a stupid idea, you know, in some ways just a dumb idea, but so incredibly addictive because it's so fun and so no barrier to entry, right? Draw a line on a screen, see the result, you know, instant gratification. And, and even with that, you know, you have to wonder to yourself, like, um, what's my goal with that, right? So the goal like, those guys had, or maybe the best option that they had from it, was sign a deal with the publisher and get it on a console. Then they're locked into, you know, advances against royalties and, uh, you know, meeting the milestones and maybe they, maybe they get it or maybe they don't. Or, or a site like Congregate, right, which is like, um, you know, desktop tower defense, right? Really, really interesting, very established normal game mechanic, totally stupid graphics, but addictive and made by one guy who has a little company, you know, who, who makes, you know, desktop tower defense, and that's what he does. And so is there a revenue model associated with that? Well, he advertises around, you know, the, when the games show, and there's a rev share that Congregate does with him on the ads that show on the Congregate site. Um, he's never going to sign a, you know, an Xbox 360 deal. Um, because the game is just, you know, that's, I don't know, maybe he will. It would be great if he did. But, but again, you know, from a, now I'm going to get really MBA on you, but like from a value creation perspective, from like a I want to control my own destiny perspective, um, you know, you kind of can go down that route and then you just get, the, the industry is trying so hard to slot, slot you into these places that they know and other people can make money off of. You know, I, I always say like, you know, developers make games because they love games. Publishers make games because they love money. You know, and you can just tell when you go into the into you go to EA, it's like Shh, these are sweet offices. You know, like my people built these offices. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. So it's really like, in some ways, a big opportunity for creativity to figure out that side of things. You know, and it's not even so much. It's the game of it's the game of uh, creatively finding a hole in the system or finding a hole in a distribution channel or an underserved audience or, or, or ways to get your content out to somebody in a different way that people haven't thought of. And that's tremendously valuable. You know? And you can write your own destiny if you can figure that out. Yes? So let me start with an observation. Uh, I, I looked very briefly at the, the casual games market, and uh, uh, at the, boy, did it, I have a lot of people want me to do a casual MMO. Okay. Um, and, and one of the things that scared me away was how quickly the casual space and the mobile space had both become just like the traditional game space and yeah. had become dominated by the traditional game space players. Yeah. So like. EA, Vivendi, I mean, it doesn't matter. Every every traditional game publisher now has a gigantic mobile initiative, which is designed to crush people yeah. like Floodgate. Yeah. You know? And the casual space, I've seen so many of my, a couple of people have actually succeeded at, at, at a level that provides them with a nice living. It's great. But I've seen many more people get stuck in, um, you know, they're not in that top 10 page, uh, on the front page. And so nobody ever finds their wonderful little game. And how do you how do you stand out in that? How do you yeah. how do you survive as a company when the big guys are trying to turn you into exactly, you know, it, are trying to take over your business? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I I'm a capitalist, right? So I don't I don't. I mean, th th they're trying to do this for their reasons, and they're very, you know, single pointed in their dedication to finding creative opportunities, and then putting their machine to take advantage of them, basically. And, and what happens is that either the company who has found that creative opportunity is bought, and 
you know, is, is bought for real money or bought for jobs. You know, if you, if you don't have enough money to keep going, like we could sell Floodgate anytime for, to anybody for jobs, you know. But like that's not, like I raised, we raised $2 million for Floodgate from angel investors, friends of mine, people in Hollywood, you know. And, and basically what I said to them is most likely you're going to lose all this money. You're never going to see a dime of it again. Um, if we don't fail, then, um, then there's two options. One is to be bought by an EA or a, a big publisher. Um, and the other is to find this, you know, find this gem in the rough and exploit it and become the company that is, you know, id for first person shooters or Bioware or, you know, th these sort of seminal developers that do, you know, uh, a hit game in their sequels, you know, or uh, and just turn off tons of cash and remain small, and you know, everyone's you know relatively happy there. So, um, so I mean, it's a real work in progress to answer your question. <laughs> there, th I don't have a good answer for you know how we do it, but it's sort of like the daily fight. You know, it's like we could go to work for somebody else at any time, you know, but like. And, and odds are we will have to, right? But like, can we at least get one more thing out there that might be the one, right? So I said to the investors, I was like, you know, we'll, we'll have three or four swings of the bat. And, you know, with the track record of Paul and the team, it's likely that we'll figure something out. But if we don't, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it's very much becoming, um, you know, to your point about uh, big publishers seeing an opportunity and coming in and bringing their their traditional models into it. Um, it's it's very much like the movie industry is, right? Which is, you know, the people who write the checks control the decisions, and the people who control the distribution control uh, how successful you can be in the end, right? So yes. Do, do, do you see much support for innovative titles? And I look at what you guys are doing, and and we've we've talked. You know, in the past, I mean, I, I think Floodgate is trying to do interesting, different things, I mean, and, and not just another Bejeweled. I mean, if I see another Bejeweled clone, I'm going to die, and, and I'm going to take the guy who made it with me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it, what, what, when when I go out to a traditional publisher with something that that I think is truly different and and innovative, yeah. it's like yeah, I don't quite get it. Why don't you just make a shooter? Yeah. It, are, is there at least some room for that in this space? Yes, uh, there absolutely is. There absolutely is. Um, because, like I said, we're at the very early stage of this industry, I believe. You know, and we don't know what it's actually going to be. You know? um, so, and, and, and there's more, you know, there's more mobility, I think, in the video game world than there is in any other creative outlet. Right? So you, 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 you know, talk about competitive. You know, try being a singer-songwriter. You know? Or a novelist, you know, or a screenwriter, you know, like that's, that's, you know, that's awful, <laughs> because it, because it's so formulaic and everyone understands so much about the market, or so they think, right? But with any kind of creative uh, endeavor, there are always people who have an inspiration and have the guts and the resources and the wherewithal to bring that inspiration to market, and you know, on a you know on a on a on a on a you know two D ten roll, you're probably not gonna come up, uh, you know, come up in the money. But people do it, you know, and so that's the thing that I think keeps us engaged in what we're doing, you know. Yes. yes. Uh, okay. So uh, one of the things that I think sets Flight apart from from many other companies in this space is you really do seem to have a a tool set that you can deploy to prototype quickly and to build on all this. I mean, you you talked about that. Um, and this is a question born of ignorance, by the way. Does does the hardware stay the same, or it's the same enough uh, to allow you to, to take maximum advantage of that, or is it like the console space where every couple of years we got something new, or every six months we have something new we have to deal with? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it, it, okay. So so on the mobile phone side, um, it's basically a, it looks like this. You know, over time, the low end is basically staying the same in terms of the you know, 128K download, you know, 10, 12, 14K of runtime memory, you know, like, like really, really, really bad at the low end. 
And then the high end keeps getting very higher and higher and higher with hardware acceleration and one meg downloads and you know so so the level of complexity that we have to deliver to our publishers is getting worse because you have to support something that looks great on a hardware accelerated phone with the latest chip from Nvidia or ATI and a crappy Nokia 3300 that was you know bought by someone's grandmother three years ago you know um, we have an embedded technology foundation that enables us to do that relatively well. We keep updating it. We fight tooth and nail for every single contract that says any improvements that we make to the underlying technology remains ours. It does not become yours. Every single contract you know, that first arrives at the office is everything that you do from the start, we sign this contract, belongs to us. Anything that you do to fix anything that you've already done belongs to us. Anything that you do in the future associated with this game or any other game that you make, you know, <laughs> belongs to us. And so it's just a matter of like, no, 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 we can't do that. And every time you say no, obviously there's a chance they're going to be like, okay, well, I'm going to go to, you know, I got a team in, uh, you know, I got a team in Mumbai who can do it, and they're happy to do it for, you know, half the cost, and we own everything. So, um, so it's an ongoing struggle, and. Um, and we have been able to, you know, maintain that kind of underlying asset of the company. Um, but I swear, I mean, uh, before I f met Paul, I met Paul because I reviewed, he did a Neverwinter Nights mobile game um, with his team, and, and I reviewed it for my site, you know, and I had never heard of them. They didn't have a website. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know they existed. They were in Boston. I was in Boston. Um, and I was like, well, who are these guys? What are they doing? Like, they're doing this crazy, awesome stuff groundbreaking stuff 40 hours of gameplay on an RPG on a phone like that's in some ways that's insane and it was insane but but it was also you know that was what he wanted to do you know um, um, and 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 we basically you know from that point on made sure that we would always own what we were doing at an underlying technology level but you know and I seriously thought mopeds was kind of my idea and and um, and I seriously thought about trying to get a studio, and I knew all the carriers, and I could bring it to market myself. And I'm sure I would have gotten snowed, taken to the cleaners any which way, because I would have taken a contract from somebody, and they would have owned everything, and I would have owned nothing. So, you know, there's really, I mean, business school analogy, but uh, you know, there's really something to be said. Like you guys are doing, working for a company for a couple years, and learning to shave on someone else's face, as they say, you know, you know, as opposed to then, when you're ready and you actually know the pitfalls, then you come out and say, all right, I'm going to make a stand. Sorry. If you guys have questions, jump in. I don't know. I'll do this all night. Uh, I don't want to talk. Um, so, so one of, one of right. Paul's... Hmm? What? Say what? Go ahead. I had a question. Yeah. Right, so the you're talking about cell phones specifically. Cell phones, yeah. Um, so the the the, uh, the sort of you know industry wisdom uh, in the in the 2002 2003 time frame was that if cell phone games were made to be played while you're waiting for the bus, while you're waiting for your dentist, you know, time killer games basically, fill the five minute gap, you know, uh, you know, don't be bored, you know, don't don't have a moment to sit and stare out in space. Instead, you know, fill it with this inane kind of, you know, uh, match three concept. Um, uh, that turns out not to be true, actually. Um, and in, in fact, most of the studies that have been done about where people play cell phone games indicate that they play them at their house. And they play them in the evening. And most of the user feedback that they've gotten is actually people lying on their couch playing a cell phone game while they watch TV. So it's not a, uh, it's not, um, but people play for a long time, you know, and there are, there, are, there are several anecdotes of people who like play, you know, bowling uh, three hours a day every single day or play, you know, Texas Hold'em poker on your cell phone uh, to the extent that like they'll launch it on a day 
um, within a week, people will have like tens of millions of dollars in virtual earnings. And the only way they sort of back that out, the only way that people could accumulate that is by that person playing for like six, eight, seven, six, eight hours a day. You know, but there's a drive, you know, in the, among the, the core audience, you know, of, of, of really wanting to win this game. Somebody um, actually wrote in, they interviewed, Sprint did a survey about their users and where you play cell phone games, and they, they talked to like the, the one tenth of one percent people on the far end of the spectrum. And uh, there was actually a guy who like would put his cell phone in a Ziploc baggie and take it into the shower and play, <laughs> <laughs> and play Bejeweled or something like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there are those people. Um, um, I don't, I, you know, is, is that a social good? You know, I don't, you know. <laughs> uh, From the developer standpoint, uh, is it something, do developers get free Yes, absolutely. You know, and and the developers have have streamed into cell phone game development opportunities or concepts because of that, like play anywhere. It's always with you, and because there's more than a billion cell phones in the world. You know, it's the single largest game platform. You know, if you're standing at thirty thousand foot view, you're looking down on the earth and you're saying, "There's a billion of these things out there." You know, and then the developers ram into like a big stone wall that's all about actually implementing that and reaching a billion people. And it gets very, very segmented very, very quickly. So that's been the big frustration, I think, for game, cell phone game developers in the last two years is realizing like you have to support 40 phones to get a game on Verizon. And it's not the 40 best-selling phones. You know, it's just, it's a block of 40 phones that they say, if you want to launch with us, these are the phones you have to support, you know. Even if no one's ever going to buy your game on 10 of those, and the next 20 are, you know, going to sell 10 units each. You know, it doesn't matter. So it's, that's, and that's, you know, to my, not to belabor my one point of the whole talk, but like, you know, it, I wish I had known that at a, at a more visceral level in some ways before we invested in the Pirates of the Caribbean, you know. And I should have known it, and I sort of did know it, but I figured, you know, we can power through this. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big uphill battle to fight. Unlikely that you're ever going to get your what you develop to go to any other country where it's popular to have cell phone games. Like, what? Why would you develop for this? Like, is there is there a big upshot? Yeah, well, this is it's a very good question. I wake up at night screaming, thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but there there are two answers to that. One is that um, one is that. There are companies that will pay developers to build games in this medium. You know, EA is one, Disney, Sony is, you know, examples of that. Um, and for a, a project that we don't have to invest our own resources in and can make money doing, we haven't, you know, we have expertise in it. We've done it well. They're paying the bills. Let's do it. You know, we, we could be doing it that way on cell phones or that way on a PC or that way on a console. So in some ways, it's like it's work, you know. It's kind of interesting technical work. It's challenging to solve these problems, you know. So it's kind of rewarding in that standpoint. You kind of think, can I possibly create a good game in that limited platform for all those different handsets? That's an intellectual challenge and an engineering challenge and a design challenge. Um, the other thing about it, though, the other answer is that um, I really firmly believe that um, it's a medium with tremendous possibilities. And if I were to think about a cell phone game, you know, to build from scratch or prototype on. I would think about you know a wireless a WAP a WAP game, you know wireless access protocol game that's basically a web browser on your phone, you know. And what does a game like that look like? There were tons of examples of games that were made for WAP uh, back before you could actually download a Java game to your phone. And there were some really really interesting ones. There was a game called um, Alien Fish Exchange where you um, you you got a at a fish and then you you know it was totally networked like dumb client on a server hitting a web page and you got your fish and then you kind of raised it and you kind of met other fish 
and you bred them, and they came up with other kinds of fish, and you traded fish, and they had babies, and you could sell some fish into this marketplace. And there was a game called uh, Data Clash, which was all about um, like uh, being uh, like um, I guess it's sort of hackers or sort of like espionage, you know. Um, black ops technical people and you had to hack into other people's networks and, and disrupt their special powers with your special powers and it was all played over WAP. And I think WAP is a great medium for prototyping stuff. You have, you have nothing on the client side that can actually drive like what we think of as gameplay, but if you can work within those design constraints, it's fully open. You can send an SMS around to anybody, any of your friends with a link they go right to the game. They can start playing right away. There's no business model associated with it, but you know Google now has AdWords for mobile, so you could put Google AdWords on your web page. Maybe, you know, start to see some revenue there. Um, so there are windows, you know, and that's what I mean. Like, the more you can dig into these things and try to figure out what's the angle, you know, what, how can I, given these behemoths that control distribution. I mean, PC games are the same way, you know, three, four years ago. You know, and then Steam came along, and the web came along. So it also doesn't stay, stay static. static. Yeah, just to, to throw in my two cents on that topic, uh, Floodgate's been around for what? What three years now? Uh, two thousand one. Okay, so in six years, you guys have shipped eight titles, nine titles, ten titles. Yeah, yeah. something like that. In the last three years, Junction Point Studios has shipped nothing. You know. Uh, Halo takes, what, four or five years? Uh, Mass Effect, four years. Let's just get Tabula Raza? Tabula Raza. <laughs> Let's not even go there because, yeah, I want to keep my friend. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is those guys get to take a bunch of swings to the plate. And the fact they're going for singles is, is no, is no crime. Uh, they're getting to do a lot of stuff that's really cool and really challenging and really fun. Uh, and they get paid to do it, you know? I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I, the, there are a lot of people in this world, uh, for whatever reason, I'm not one of them, but there are a lot of people in this world who don't want to spend two years, three years of their lives slogging through, you know, one thing, you know, with about a 60% chance that you'll actually get to the finish one. So the, in this space, I mean, I, I know lots of people in this space, and they just churn stuff out. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. one guy can go contract with two other people and get something up on Yahoo Games. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Even if you even if you don't make a whole lot of money, um, you get to be a game designer, and you get to be a game developer, and you could argue that I haven't been one for three years, you know. So there's there's a lot of good there. The 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 thing that I'm I miss most about um, you know running a web business though is that ability to respond to what consumers, readers, friends, people do with your stuff, and 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 games in general are so. You know, it, whether it's a six-month project or a five-year project, it's so much about like this internal process of like, duh, 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 you know, internal thinking and oh, you know, talking and arguing about what you think, what color the guy's shield should be or whatever, and then you do it and you put it out there. You know, you put it on the web or you put it in a retail box or whatever, and then it's out there and you just sort of sit back and you're like, oh God, I'm cooked. You know, I hope somebody buys my game. You know, and the thing about the web that I love so so much is that like, you can put it out there, see what people do, take it down, change it, add something else, add a new feature, tweak it around. Anybody play um, zombies on Facebook? You know, it's a game that's like, it's not even a game. It's a, it's a, it, you know, it's a pyramid scheme basically of a game, but like. It's a, it's crazy what they've done with it. They keep adding new features all the time, and then then there's like a Resident Evil 4 ad across it, so you can see they're making a little bit of money on it. And then they add a new thing where there's werewolves and stuff like that. And you know, I wish like there was much more to it there. But it's a game that like millions of people play. You know, annoyingly sometimes, right? I'm sick of being bitten by Mark Olila zombie. You know, like, but it, but it, it's like so, so, so. There's a sense of iteration and and. Um, and flexibility with design that the web enables that um, you know really none of these games right here enable. Um, and so what we're doing, you know, in the future is really working on modular design, such that we can be more responsive to what people do with the stuff that we create. You know, and and if you get a if you get enough people to come in, they'll do things with your game that you never uh, never would have imagined. You know, like. Um, 
One of the seminal experiences in my um, video game life was um, was Load Runner, um, which uh, is kind of a cool, fun little game. Um, but it had a level editor, and I had never encountered a level editor before. And it suddenly meant that like I could take the mechanics of the game and make my own stuff with it, you know. And um, and uh, and Counter Strike is you know kind of a more modern example of that same kind of dynamic, right? Where somebody took a game that was you know, essentially it was a done free game that was out there and, and they tweaked it and made their own levels and they started distributing that and suddenly like they're a company, like the people that made the level is the company, you know, and uh, and uh, the massive hit. And so um, that kind of opportunity I think is something, again, when you're thinking of your creative vision to think, you know, do I want to be in a world where I lock myself away with my team who I really have to like now and probably won't like at the end of the process? Um, or do I want to be more responsive? You know, do I want to be more flexible and able to kind of uh, play with people? Oh, this is kind of a cool screensaver. It, it's, uh, it's, it's responsive to sound. I kind of I like it. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, wait, sorry, there's a guy. Yeah, um, I, the Flash world to me is is one of the most interesting um, PC um, opportunities um, because it's so instantly accessible to so many people. It's like the exact opposite of, of cell phone games, right? It's like basically almost every browser in the world right now can play a Flash game, um, and and what you're seeing now with ways to monetize that experience is. You know something like uh, Puzzle Pirates or Rune, RuneScape, or you know where they they build like these really really easy Flash windows into the game, so you can play a little game in the browser and then you can delve deeper into it. You know, and at some point they hope to capture your credit card information and charge you for it, right? But but because it's so widely distributable, um, you can get your stuff in front of people. Now, um, Daycare Nightmare, which is as close as we've gotten to that world, you know, to date. Um, has been played, even we launched it July 15th, it's been played by over half a million people, right? Um, you know, roughly one and a half, two and a half percent of people actually bought the thing. Um, um, but it is, there's some sense of gratification knowing that like, you know, now 500,000 people have had an experience with Molly and, and the little baby dragon, you know, like that's kind of a great thing. And, and, um, and I'd love to do a sequel and I'd love to kind of explore that world further, you know what I mean? Um, and Flash is kind of even further in that direction because you can very, very quickly prototype kind of a game experience. So I think Flash is incredibly, incredibly interesting. And because it's incredibly interesting and because it's incredibly easy to prototype, it's also uh, incredibly swamped, right? <laughs> uh, with, with, you know, competing stuff. Stuff that's competing for people's attention. But, um, but in a way, it doesn't matter because it's a five-minute disposable experience, and people will share it around with their friends. You know, the other thing I hate about cell phone games is that it's locked into a particular cell phone, like you were saying before, right? And so, um, you know, who here has played Mopets, right? Who here has played Pirates of the Caribbean multiplayer? Like, no one. You know, I, I I can't wait to meet the first you know Pirates of the Caribbean guild leader. I'll give him a big kiss because like. He's a rare bird, <laughs> and 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 that's that's a frustrating thing, honestly. You know, and that's something that, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, you you do things for different reasons, and nobody should be in this business uh, to 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 make a million dollars. You know, you're doing it for different reasons, and uh, the economics of the industry, as Warren can can attest, are set up to take advantage of that fact. Right? Um, there there are plenty of people who are trading off. Um, economic benefits uh, for the opportunity to do something creative and, and, and make something fun that people enjoy. You know, like I, I recruited the, the guy who wrote the server for um, Pirates of the Caribbean, came up to me after I did a talk in New York, and he was like, I work at Nortel, I've been at Nortel for seven years, I have a graduate degree in you know, computer science from MIT, um, I make tons of money, and I just, I cannot deal with Nortel, you know, networking protocols anymore. Can I please, you know, come work at a game studio? And I'm like, yeah, fine. You know, you're going to earn half of what you make now, 
He was like, I just want to make somebody smile. You know, I just want to <laughs> make, you know. And, and that's, a, that's a motivator for a lot of people. That's a perfect lead into the question I've been wanting to ask. Uh, one of Paul's, I mean, one of the, the things that makes Paul a, just a genius is his ability to find really talented people willing to work for peanuts. I mean, no, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> right. no, where, where, do, where do you get your resource from? I guess there's some, some ex-looking glass folks. Yeah. That I understand. Um, there's at least one guy on your staff who's an ex-paper game guy. Yep. Where, 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 are you, where does Floodgate find people? I mean, is it out of courses like this? Is it out of MIT still? Where, where are you yes. getting it? Yeah. yeah. So we have a core group of people who have worked together for, you know, 10 years um, at at uh, Looking Glass Studios and then now at Floodgate. Um, and then there's also people that we meet randomly, you know, um, people that send in their resumes, people that send in their portfolios just randomly. Um, we really try, we, we developed a pretty good relationship with MIT. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's a channel for people who are interested in, in you know, trying new things, trying either cell phone or PC stuff. Um, you know, if, if, in a way, that ability to like find people who can work in a stressful environment with very little structure um, and produce <coughs> creative, you know, code or creative art or creative design, um, you know, on time and under budget, and don't freak everybody else out, you know and whose you know, personal hygiene is not so bad that no one else can work with them, are really, really rare people. And so the, 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 the search for talent uh, is like an ongoing struggle. You know? um, and it's always true in any kind of business that people are the most um, important part of the company and the, and the most uh, difficult to kind of um, work with, basically. <laughs> um, uh, but but you know, I think we, we have been relatively lucky um, to find great people um, and people who are dedicated to, to what we do. And it's very much a, you know, it's very much sort of a, we're going to be really upfront with you about what you're kind of going to go through and the sacrifices you're going to make, the trade-offs that you're going to make to take on this job. But, you know, the rewards are something more than just the paycheck at the end of the week because sometimes that doesn't come. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> any, any other questions, comments, thoughts? Yes. <laughs> um, you guys have a really short development cycle. Are you do, how many are you working on at a time? Just one, or are you pipeline? We work, we work on three to four projects at a time. Um, so right now, we have one game, which is just wrapped up, um, just went gold master last week. We just got the Goldmaster payment last week, which is great. Um, we have one game that's sort of like between alpha and beta, cell phone game. Um, and we have one project that's just starting. Um, and then we're pitching right now for you know, our, next, our next big project. So um, for cell phone and these kind of casual PC games, it's like six to 12 months. Um, <clears throat> so there's, you know, th there's a constant um, new interesting project to work on, and there's a constant need for new projects to work on. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so um, it's a relatively short time cycle compared to a lot of the other stuff that's, that's being done. Yeah, we, we've done a bunch of PDA games, like we did Age of Empires for PDAs. What? That, that seems like another sort of medium that's really sort of strange and hard to design for because of the difference in all the different PDAs, right? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. On the other hand, um, you know, because of that, there are all these, the, there's not that many good games, you know, so if you come up with a good game and put it on Handango and people are like, wait, this is actually a good game for my PDA, incredible. Um, so you can sell you can sell a lot of units, and some of the games that we did in 2004 for PDAs are still paying off royalties. So, you know, I, I can't knock that market, but um, you know, but DS is awesome. I mean, 50 million DSs have been sold. Like that's crazy. 50 million of a unified platform with no porting. If you support that stuff, you know, and you you were talking about if I see another Match Three game, uh, Puzzle Quest, Match Three game in a role-playing environment. 
It's crazy. It's absolutely insane, but it's totally addictive because have you, anybody played Puzzle Quest? It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like killer. It's crazy. It's like, who would have thought that a match three gem matching game would be so fun? You make it a battle mechanic, and suddenly you're just like, oh, obsessively like matching gems again. You're like, oh, I, thought I, I thought I gave this up. Um, uh, so, you know, so there's like weird ways to tweak it. But in that world, right, you're working for a publisher because you can't get distribution direct. And they're going to put it in a box and put it on a shelf along with another 50 other titles. And anytime you know, anyone says 50 million units of anything sold, you know that the big publishers are in there funding 10 different projects. And you're, you know, I mean, I would love it when you can, uh, when they open up the Wi Fi side of that and you can download content, you know, through a Wi Fi zone without having to go through Nintendo approvals. That's never going to happen, but you know, but it, <laughs> you know, but but yeah. So with every platform, I mean, I think that's an awesome platform, and we haven't done any, and and um, and I really think we should. You know, we're talking to a publisher right now about doing a DS project, but um, but you know, it's uh, it's certainly not a panacea. I've been any, everyone been playing the Zelda DS game, right? So it's like uh, it's freaking amazing. It's the only game I've played is where my hands don't start cramping up after an hour because you use the stylus to move Link around the, the field. And it's the most innovative control mechanism for any, any PC game I've ever, any computer game I've ever played. And, um, and then they use the microphone. So like you find these maps and you have to go <laughs> and blow the dust off the maps. <laughs> you know, um, you have to blow out torches and stuff like that. You have to, it's really, 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 really cool. I would highly recommend it. Anything else? Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, so uh, I think we should take a break, but before we do, I just want to say about half a dozen things that I was scribbling notes while, uh, while Matthew was talking. Uh, first of all, uh, I couldn't see how many people played Dark Messiah, Might and Magic, Dark Messiah. Nobody. You should all play it. Okay, first of all, because it's a pretty cool game. Uh, second of all, because Arcane, the company that did it, actually has an Austin office that they're going to be growing over the next couple of years, and so you might get a job out of it. So uh, by all means, play it. Uh, I want to reiterate what Matthew said about the importance of pitching. Uh, there are plenty of people, even at my own studio now, who are absolutely brilliant designers, brilliant programmers, and I'm a better pitcher than they are. I know you might find that hard to believe, but uh, the, the ability to pitch a game to uh, an executive, uh, to a studio GM, to a lead programmer, lead designer, whatever, is critical. So uh, in, in your labs, when you get the chance to get up in front of people and talk, take advantage of that. Um, if you're shy, get over it, uh, because you really need to be able to uh, communicate with your peers and to, to people outside of your, your whatever company you end up working for. Um, I, I think I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to thank Matthew for reminding me again that every part of the game business is completely broken. Um, and uh, for, I mean, I'm going around behind you there. To your point, you're right. I mean, the cell phone market is completely broken. Um, PDA, completely broken. Casual game, completely broken. PC, broken. I, I you know, publishers, broken. No, I think it's completely broken. We can, <laughs> do you want to come up here and get the microphone? We can duke it out. I mean, it, it, I would agree that it's suboptimal, but oh, not broken. Quibbling. No, but, 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 but there's a big difference between broken means that, like, it's not worth pursuing, you know. Oh, no, I would never. <laughs> I would never. S I've been doing this for 24 years. It's so certainly worth pursuing. <laughs> I am broken, but we don't have to get into that. No, I mean, I just think, so, like, my point was basically that even, even though, and I've been as open as I can about the difficulties that each person encounters and, and our company has encountered and delving into each of these channels, but um, there is opportunity there, and the, the fundamental drive that we have is both a creative drive and an opportunity drive. And so I, I don't want to, as, as, as depressing as I might be in these talks, I don't want to leave you the impression that I think, you know, it's hopeless, barren waste of, you know, opportunity, you know, down the drain. And I wasn't trying to characterize okay. your, your talk in that way, by the way. Oh, there's a question.
No, no I, 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 I mean, it, it might be venting, but it's venting for a purpose, which is to try to, um, to try to just explain one person's perspective on it, right? And I'm relatively new to the games industry. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 38 years old, but I haven't spent my entire career in the games industry. Um, so I, I don't at all feel like, um, but I, what I want to say is basically to give you a perspective of, um, you know, one person's view of running into the walls and trying to overcome them. And that, in a sense, is the challenge, both from a creative and a business standpoint. Um, so I don't want to gloss over the challenges that you will, um, that you will face, you know, if you decide to pursue this, or even if you just be in this course, right? I mean, I, and I hope that, um, you know, by, you know, talking about the, the, the barriers, um, you will then think about those barriers such that when you come up to pitch your thing at the end of the class, you know, and Warren says, who's going to play that game? You know, you can talk about it. How are you going to bring it to market? You can talk about it. How much is that going to cost? You can just say, well, rough numbers, it's a $1 million game or a $10 million game, you know, because all those things are integral and as important to me uh, in terms of the eventual success of a product as, you know, whether it's a third-person camera perspective or a first-person camera perspective or whether it's set in the near future or the distant future or the hypothetical past or whatever. Like, so, so that's why I, I dwell on the things that um, are obstacles because the challenge and sort of, from my point of view, the motivation comes from there's something here, right? There's something here. We have to find out what it is, you know? And we're gonna f we're gonna come across these hurdles, you know, but knowing that they're there will help us then overcome them or come up with creative solutions for them. Yeah, just to, to answer that in in my I don't know if who you were actually asking. So uh, I do a lot of venting. I mean, I'm kind of a whiner. You should do what you do best, <laughs> and and I do it for a variety of reasons. I mean, one is uh, because I, I am so frustrated at the the potential of this medium and how little we exploit it. Uh, and, and, how, and I get frustrated at the barriers. So occasionally I just, I just do need to vent, right? And you're a captive audience, so you get the brunt of it. Um, it it's also, though, that this is a very, very um, <coughs> difficult medium. It, it is, making games is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, and I've been married for 20 years, you know? I mean, it is, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And um, if you're not ready for it, uh, it can be it can be pretty brutal. I mean, I've I've sadly probably caused divorces. I'm, okay, I have made people work hard enough that they ended up getting divorced. That could be completely misinterpreted. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, and and I have I have seen people who who literally went crazy. I mean, literally like tinfoil hat kind of crazy. Uh, I've seen people have nervous breakdowns. I've had employees crying in my office, um, and so. One of the reasons to, to bring out uh, some of the, the barriers is, is uh, obviously so you can, you can find ways to break through them, but also so it, you, know, you can decide if this is right for you. Uh, we're in a setting where you can hear about all this stuff without having to experience all the pain. Uh, and, and so part of um, a university education for me is a weeding out. I mean, I, I spent two years as a journalism major and got weeded out. I realized I was not gonna cut it in that world because there were 20 people in a class like this who were more committed and wanted it more than I did. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I hope I, I hope I paint and, and the people who come here paint a picture of how wonderful this is. I mean, I love my job and I love my company and I love the people I work with. Um, you know, but it ain't all, it ain't all roses. Uh, so there, there's that. Um, yeah, I could go on like that for days. But anyway, that's it, it, it's partly just so you you know what you're getting into, so you can decide if you want to get into it. You know. Um, yeah, I guess the last thing I'll say is um, uh, I, I'm actually probably more hopeful than 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 sometimes I might let on. Uh, and if, if did any of you go to the indie games conference last year? Not not this one. The year before, I, I gave I gave the keynote there, and I, maybe I should whip that out and give that talk tonight and the hour we have. I mean, the, the problem is the business is broken. The, the medium, the art form is, is vital and, and growing and changing. And there are people doing amazing things. I mean, some of them you saw up on the screen. I mean, when I, when I first saw the, the Pirates of the Caribbean multiplayer, I mean, the mobile game, I just couldn't believe it, you know? 
Um, Age of Empires on a PDA. I mean, Paul did um, uh, Underworld on a PDA years ago. It's like, oh my God. I mean, that was a high-end PC game a while back. I mean, there is innovation everywhere. Um, and I think uh, the, the problem is you have to break through the barriers. You have to be one of those people who can get up and pitch effectively enough to get your opportunity, or you have to be daring enough to go off on your own and do completely crazy stuff like, like these guys do, um, and just not be willing to back down. If, you, if, if I can talk you out of being in this business, you had no chance of succeeding. If I can convince you that, that this sucks, you're, you're doomed. You know, Get out now. <laughs> Trust me. Um, well, after you get your grade. After you get your, yeah, there, there you go. Um, so that, that, that's, that's part of why I, if I come off too negative, I mean, you guys should slap me around. I know you will anyway. Um, you know, slap me around a little bit. I can take it, you know, but, but it's really, it is with a purpose, yeah. as Matthew said. So, okay, with that, let's take a break. Uh, we'll come back in about five, ten minutes. Um, but what I, what I did, uh, to be completely frank, was I went back to a bunch of old lectures I've given at Game Developers Conference and elsewhere and said, okay, what, what can I do that's relevant to what you guys are, are doing in the labs right now? Um, and came up with uh, a couple of things that would be useful. I don't think I have time to get through everything, so I'm going to try to try to rip through this this part of it, the first part. Um, what I want to do is sort of walk you through um, a process that I go through when I'm thinking about starting a new game idea. And I, I think I, I already mentioned the seven questions that I asked. Did I already did I put that slide up? Yeah. Okay. I want to go into that in a little more detail and a little more specifically. Um, I have not looked at these slides or my notes from it in probably four years, so uh, this, is, this will be an interesting exercise. We'll see how it goes. Um, this came out of a, a game design challenge. The, every year at the Game Developers Conference, there's a, a game design challenge. Um, uh, Harvey, who was here a couple weeks ago, um, actually won that challenge uh, a couple years ago. Uh, he he, he kind of got his, his butt kicked this past year, which if you ever want to get under his skin, just mention that. Uh, Alexei Pajitnov, the guy who did Tetris, won, uh, and, and St Harvey's still annoyed about that. But uh, I participated in the first one, uh, and it was me, Will Wright, and Raf Koster, uh, and I got my ass kicked, let me tell you. Um, but I got my ass kicked because of my process, I'd like to think, not because of talent, okay? Uh, and because of the kinds of games I like to make, and the reasons I like to make them, which uh, uh, Matthew, I think, would probably find rather appalling because I, I don't think very much about commercial stuff, uh, or enough anyway. Um, so this will be a somewhat different uh, approach to things. Uh, the topic was uh, design a love story. Uh, and both Will and Raf cheated, and I did not. And so uh, I lost. Okay. So the bottom line is I have no idea how to make a love story game. Um, you know, if, and like it says on the slide, I mean, if I did know, I'd, I'd do it because I'm sick to death of, you know, shooters and, and the, the verbs we give players uh, in games today and have given, they're the same verbs we've been giving players for the last 25 years. Um, so uh, in a sense, I guess this is, this is kind of a, a depressing, another depressing talk, excellent. I just realized that. There's a theme for the evening. Um, so uh, what... What I want to do is sort of, like I said, walk you through the process that I arrived at uh, before I gave up and acknowledged failure. Um, so, since I don't, I don't have, to, I, I don't know how to solve the problem. I just want to talk about uh, the real issues associated with translating a love story into into a more games-friendly format. Um, so, uh, I mean, this actually reflects the way I work, which is kind of terrifying. Um, you know. The first thing you have to do is you have to pick your platform and your game style. I mean, uh, are, if you're making a cell phone game, that implies certain things. If you're making a, uh, an MMO, that implies certain things. Um, you have to find out what the real problems are. Okay, what are you really trying to simulate here? Uh, and the fact that I just asked that question probably says more than it should about, about how I approach things. Um, when, when someone says make a love story game, I want to try to make you feel the way you do when you're in love, you know? Um, so I do like just insane amounts of research. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, and then, you know, you think until blood pours from your forehead. Um, so, for example, like if you were gonna do an MMO, uh, you could just sort of let nature take its course, right? I mean, you have 
real people, you throw them together in a situation, even if it's virtual, where they share some interests, um, and you wait for two to feel some sparks. Okay, you're done, love story, great, okay. Um, the, the two pe people would, um, uh, they would share whatever experiences the game allows, they'd interact in ways that are personally significant to them, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and maybe they'd experience some two-bit version of love. I mean, you know, hey, they have an online wedding, you know, you win. Um, I think uh, the, the big thing here is that first one, though. There's, there's a lack of, well, there's a lack of physical intimacy and there's a lack of visual and sensory input in general that would probably mean you'd, you'd never end up with more than a half-baked version of, 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 you know, the feeling of love. But when you have real people interacting, it doesn't take much, um, you know, to actually, actually make you feel like something. If you're making a God game, um, you know, what would you do? Uh, you know, if it, I, I sort of figure Will, might, Will Wright might do something like this. You know, what, identify what the stages of love are and the physiological elements of love, build game systems that, that sort of simulate them, create some avatars, um, you know, offer activities that, uh, that uh, are designed to, to affect, you know, the, the measurable characteristics associated with falling in love, which I, I'll talk about more than you probably want me to in a minute. Um, you uh, track the stats, you know, are characters falling in love with me, you know? And then uh, you'd, you'd just say that a player has won the game. So in a story game though, single player story game, that's, where, that, that's what I would wanna do. Uh, and I don't have any idea. Uh, the challenges may be insurmountable. It, it may be that, you know, running, jumping, shooting, uh, you know, it's kind of solving puzzles, moving things around is what we do. Um, so, uh, but, but as I start to think about it, you know, maybe we can offer people lessons um, that, that might about love, about, about the feeling of, of establishing a, that, that kind of connection with someone else that they could translate, that they could use in the real world, okay? Um, you could create a story that allows you to follow the trajectory of, of a love affair, uh, seeing how love grows and wanes and, you know, reforms itself and redefines itself and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, if you really wanted to make someone feel like they were in love, here's where we get to my, my seven questions. And this is not something that, that applies just to how would I do a love story or should I do a love story. Um, but these are the questions I ask myself before I start working on a game. And as I've said, I think even in here earlier, uh, I don't even know if my wife knows I do this. I mean, I, I just, until recently, I never talked about it publicly. It's just something I always did. And I, and I started to realize that other people weren't doing this, or at least they weren't articulating it. And I think it, it, it kind of hurt them. Um, so I've, I've decided to start talking about this. And I think if you can't answer all these questions, you probably haven't thought through your idea well enough, okay? So what exactly are you trying to do? What's the core idea? Um, you know, are you trying to uh, make someone feel the emotions of love, the, get the chemicals flowing in the body? Or are you trying to, you know, just make, make someone, you know, recreate the honeymooners or, or some television show. Oh, there's a hand up already. Holy cow. Yeah, so this is the time of love. This is a, a currency player um, for a book about this particular experience for for Jeff and Mary. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well again for for me as when I started thinking about this, I immediately gravitated towards make you feel uh, what you would feel for a real person, but make you feel that for a virtual person. I mean again there's if if you read uh, oh, what is her name? Um, there's a researcher who's, who's written a lot of books about um, the, the physiology of love, the chemicals, the literal chemicals that are, are released from your body when you're in different stages of a love affair. And uh, for all the, the, you know, highfalutin, you know, we're, we're people and we're better than animals, you know, uh, sort of thinking that, that we all indulge in, uh, the, the feeling of being loved. Uh, you know, in those early phases where your face is all flushed and you can't keep your hands off each other and all that stuff. You know, that has a, a distinct chemical, uh, that is a response to chemicals being released in your body. At least this one person believes that. Um, and then similarly, when those chemicals start to wane, you start feeling different things and you establish different kinds of bonds because different kinds of chemicals are released when you're in this other person's presence and all that sort of stuff. And so what, what I immediately wanted to do was see if I could get get the body to release those chemicals. I mean, we can release adrenaline when you play Halo, you know. Uh, well, can we release other chemicals into the body, right? 
so that was kind of what I was thinking. It's not so much a love story, but a story that uh, elicits the chemicals of love. Okay. Yeah. So you think you could see there's like people, you know, from trying to live the real love, and you say, you know, hey, I oh, could <laughs> <gave> today. <laughs> well, you, you know, cutting, cutting about 20 slides further down, I decided that this was a really bad idea. It was very poorly suited to games. And so I, I, I never, I mean, I lost the, uh, the, the game design challenge because I said, here is my meta talk about why this is such a bad idea. And the other guys said, well, here's the lame ass little thing I would do that would sort of fake it, you know? Um, so uh, gosh, I, I mean, I hope we never stop actually loving real people, okay? <laughs> Um, and, and just to completely deviate from the talk here and, and you know, blow what little time I have, um, you know, a lot of people th over the years have, have accu not accused me, have, have just assumed that I think the, the holodeck is the be all end all, and I just don't. I think it's a really stupid idea. I mean, the, the, the perfect recreation of reality is, is just dumb. I mean, art happens within constraints, and, and I, don't, I don't see myself as a creator of, of an alternate reality. I see myself as a creator of. Of, uh, of, of, you know, a story or an art or a, a piece of art, you know? Uh, and I'm no longer ashamed to admit that, by the way. The many people in this business are. Yeah. So I'm not going to get to slide five. This is cool. Go. You, you think that, it, it seems to me that your perspective isn't necessarily that this is something that you can't do, it's something that you should do. Yes and no. If you run through all of these questions and you can't answer them clearly, that means one of two things. Either you haven't thought this through well enough and you better not take any of someone else's money and you probably don't want to waste any of your own until you have thought it through better. Or this is something that is not well suited to the medium you are working in and you better find another medium. You would be better off finding another medium, okay? Um, you know, if you were, just to say, if you're creating the holodeck, you're not going to do it with oil paints, you know? Uh, if you... Uh, if you want to tell a clear story, you want to tell, con convey a story, music is probably not the best medium to use, okay? Every medium has its, its potentials and its limitations. And I, for me, just for me, your, your mileage may vary. These questions allow me to get to the point where I can say, yeah, this, this idea is well suited to my medium, okay? So that it does lead to a should, but that's not, its, that's not really its ultimate purpose. It's to, to challenge myself and test myself and make sure that I understand my idea well enough to say, yeah, this will work, and I'm not wasting my time. Is, is it you questions that you derive the idea of <coughs> in your well to a particular challenge? Yes. I, I admit that I do that. Does that mean, I mean, it's, it's not an absolute. You know, again, your answers to, the, to the exactly the same question about exactly the same idea may, may differ. And that's great. That's why, you know, there's a Peter Molyneux and a Will Wright and a Doug Church and a Paul Nurath and a, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, and that's, that's terrific, you know? It just means that I'm not going to go and do this if the answers are, aren't clear. What, yeah. What's your employment for question number four? Um, well, let me get to that. Let me get to that. I will get to what The question was, what's the, what's the, the, the significance of, of question number four? Um, so uh, the, the, the issue, the, fir the first one is you just need to understand what you're trying to accomplish. For me, it was I want to simulate the chemicals that are released when you, when you fall in love, okay? Um, what's the potential is just, um, you know, does this have the sales potential? Does this have the player appeal? Does this have the... Uh, the, the, uh, the likelihood of advancing the state of the art in some way. I mean, all the things that are important to me. Again, that's, that's where your answers may vary and where, uh, you know, Peter Molyneux's answers may vary or Tim Schafer's answers may vary. Uh, that's, that's where, you know, Doug Church's games are different from Ken Levine's games, you know, and, and Cliffy B's games are different from, you know, Ray and Greg's up at Bioware. So that's, that's, that is the, the, the sort of the, the most personal of the questions. What are the, the most challenging things you have to tackle to make the game? The third question. Um, if you don't have a clear idea of the development challenges, you're gonna fail. Now, having said that, it might still be worth going ahead even if you, if you don't really understand them because until you've actually been through your concept phase, you know, you've actually concepted this thing out, you understand what you're really trying to do, 
Um, it's possible that you won't understand all the development challenges. But if at this early stage, right at the beginning, you can identify you know, 10 challenges where another game might offer fewer, <laughs> you might not want to move ahead. Out of four. Okay. This is the one that, that gets me in trouble even with my teams. Uh, it's probably the one that gets Paul in trouble. Now I know it's the one that gets Paul in trouble. Okay. Uh, and the, the bottom line is I don't do this for money. And I don't do this even to put a smile on someone's face. I, I do this because I, I, I just, well, I do this for a bunch of reasons. But one of the reasons is um, I think we have barely scratched the surface of the potential of our medium. And that, that's not just on cell phones, and it's not just on PDAs, and it's, it's not just in flash games. It's everywhere. Um, and, and I am bored very easily. Uh, and if you're going to spend three years of your life you better be, uh, be able to identify something, some, some set of things that you're going to do that are, are different from what other people have done, you know? Um, or, it, or it's probably not worth doing. It's probably not worth someone giving you the money to do it, you know? Being the 10th the, the GTA clone on the, you know, out there is probably not the best commercial decision to make. It's certainly not the most creative decision to make. It's doing nothing for the medium. I just don't want to do it, you know? Again, your your questions may be different, you know, uh, and I guess I guess more than you should go through these questions, you should have your your set of questions. You should know what you need to know before you embark on a, a three plus year, you know, death march, because uh, that's largely what game development is. Um, there are people in my studio who don't agree with this. I mean, there are people who just who say, you know, let's just execute really well on something. You could argue that Halo 1, the first Halo game, I mean, other than the fact that it was on a console and it had pretty good AI, what was new? Name one thing that was new in Halo. It was just a very well, just, it was a very well executed console version of games that we had been making on the PC for 10 years. World of Warcraft. I mean, Blizzard, we're going to have uh, uh, the, the, the president of Blizzard in, in this room uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is uh, execution versus innovation because uh, Blizzard is the king. Well, I don't want to tip my hand. We'll find out about this in a couple of weeks. Um, so, uh, again, your, your, your answers, your questions may vary, but for me, if, if, if there isn't something in this game, something core to this game that is new, that has never been done before, I have no interest in doing it. Okay. Um, and then how well suited to games is the idea. I mean, can you, in, can you close your eyes and envision this game up on a screen? Can you imagine what players are going to do? Uh, can you see how it would play out? Can you imagine the game systems that would be required to make it work? Um, what's the player fantasy? Uh, if, if you think you can convince players to be interested in something, you are wrong. <laughs> okay, either that or you command a marketing budget on the scale of Microsoft. Um, most of us can't claim that. Uh, I used to think I could educate people, and I, I just don't think that anymore. Uh, find fantasies that, that, or for me, again, this is my list. I, I try to find fantasies that people already have and find ways to exploit them. Um, uh, not exploit them, that's the wrong word. There's a negative connotation to that. I want to allow players to, to, to live out fantasies that they already have instead of teaching them that they should be interested in something that they're not. Um, and then what does the player do? Uh, that's the most important question. I mean, in a nutshell right there. Uh, what are the verbs? We've I, I've, I've mentioned this before. Uh, if you can't describe your verbs in very, very simple terms, you haven't thought this through enough. Um, and, then, and then make sure they're verbs that are good gaming verbs. Um, you know, uh, en enjoy meaningless. Learn, meaningless, because learn is, is made up of a bunch of subverbs. I mean, and those subverbs are the things that you're actually doing. How do you learn? What do you do to learn? Uh, games are about very visceral, uh, very simple activities uh, that add up to sometimes very complex feelings, very complex um, outcomes. But the verbs that we do are very, very simple. And I don't think that's going to change much. Uh, at least not until we have a lot more tools at our disposal than we do now. As long as we're sitting there doing this, or this, or even this, th we can do physical things. That's about it, you know? 
I mean, how would you even, I guess you could hug, actually. Now the Wii could allow you to hug. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, what are the verbs? Hug is a good verb, okay? In, in fact, now that I think about it. Um, so let me, let me look at, at each of these in, in more detail. So in, in a love story, what are you trying to do? Uh, in, the, in the best of all possible worlds, for me, it would be a game where the player actually feels something resembling real love for a virtual partner. Uh, again, I'm not, these are not absolutes. I mean, I, I'm going to stop qualifying at this moment. This is the last time I'm going to say that. Um, you know, in the real world, I would probably settle for a game that, that teaches the player something about love, about relationships, about how it grows and wanes and all that stuff and changes over time. Um, I, I, I might even settle for a game in which the player, you know, okay, one thing you have to remember. Sorry, I'm going to digress. We can't make players feel anything. You can't make players feel anything. Um, you can't know what they're going to be feeling. They may be laughing as they're spraying blood all over the walls. You know, you can't make them feel scared. You can't make them feel anything. Um, so uh, you, it may be that, that what we, the best we can do is make a game where a virtual character loves them, loves the player, uh, and you learn something about love that way. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of. For the purposes of this exercise, I mean, it's a platform agnostic thing. I don't, I don't even care what platform. I, I want to make a game that makes, I mean, fundamentally, I want to make a game that makes you feel like you're in love, okay? That's, that's it. Why do it? Um, well, it, it's, there's the opportunity to offer completely new kinds of content, which has strong appeal for me. Um, uh, you know, games, games are about being thugs and killing zombies and, you know, building armies and jumping from platform to platform, and I mean, you all know what games, I mean, the, the range of game content is so appallingly limited, uh, it's kind of scary. Um, so the opportunity to offer something completely new is kind of appealing. Um, I think if, if I told my wife, no, my wife's a World of Warcraft nut, that's probably a bad example. Um, if I told my mother that I was making a game about love, she might actually want to play it, as opposed to, I'm making a game where you're a guy who wears a trench coat, carries two nine millimeters, and wears sunglasses at night, and you get to kill a bunch of stuff or sneak by them. She's just not interested. So um, it's content that we know people already care about. Um, it, it would force us to think about how to do better characters and actors, which would help us no matter what kind of game we end up making. Uh, and it probably can't be done, which is, the best reason of all to do something. Uh, a lesson I sadly learned from Paul Nurath. Um, so uh, I already talked a little bit about this, but what do we want to? What do we want the players to experience? What, uh, you know, what, what should they feel when they're playing this game? Um, so there are the stages of love. Like I said I went and did a bunch of research just for this talk, which is crazy. Um, but uh, you know, it, it happens over time. Uh, and in discrete stages that have, you know, many people actually believe are, you know, there's that attraction, romance, passion, intimacy, commitment, all that stuff. Um, you know, no two, no two researchers actually agree on what those stages are, by the way, I should be clear. Um, but uh, it involves all of the senses, um, you know, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, all that stuff. Um, you know, uh, a lot of researchers think that sight is the most important, but still, you know, that all of a sudden, if you're starting to see challenges, you know, you're, you're right with me here. Um, we appeal to two senses, <laughs> okay? Uh, typically, sight and sound. Occasionally, we get into haptic responses and stuff, but typically, we deal with two senses. Um, and there's all sorts of bizarre hormonal stuff that, I mean, like I said, the, all, of those, all of those things get released when you're at very, in various stages of love. Um, Okay, it is, uh, we want the player to experience some of those rituals uh, that lead to, to something uh, like love. Um, and uh, it, it elicits a physical response, okay? I mean, we've all, I hope we've all, I hope you've all felt this. Um, you know, uh, there are specific kinds of physicality, I mean, posturing and all sorts of things about, uh, researchers call them natural courting cues uh, that we could simulate, I guess. Um, so, but that's that's what we would that's what we would want players to experience. If you're, all of a sudden it's starting to look really scary. Um, okay, so again, the challenges, the development challenges. We can't force players to feel anything. It requires character interaction, which we don't do well. Uh, love is a many splendored thing. I don't even know what the hell I was thinking when I wrote that one. Um, 
but uh, also it's very hard to make somebody feel something when they know it's not real. And and you know even if you're staring at a, you know you've got your new 70 inch Mitsubishi, you know, and it's all surround this and all that. It's you're just not gonna you're not gonna feel anything. Um, so uh, the feeling challenge is huge. Um, you know, you might be saying, so what? I mean, other media don't require that you actually, that audience members fall in love. Um, but in other media, we can at least make you feel empathy for characters. Um, you know, you, you, you really do feel like, I mean, I'm trying to think of a good movie that you've all seen. But anyway, I mean, imagine a movie where, you know, the hero's really, really racked with guilt or something, and you feel empathy for him. You, you, you can uh, relate. Um, other media just have to, have to pr make you believe that the characters feel the way they do, that, that a character on the screen in a movie feels a particular way. That character is in love. You're sitting in the audience. You believe that character's in love. You feel empathy. Ah, oh, you feel great. You know, they're in love. It's a pretty low bar. Uh, it doesn't matter if the, play, if the viewer in a movie feels a, a particular emotion. It doesn't matter what the, what, what the viewers feel at all. In a game, um, there, there is no disconnect between what the character feels and what the player feels. Okay? If there is, you don't have much of, a, of an engaging experience. Okay? So in a game, it's not enough that you have empathy for a character on the screen. You have to feel what that character is feeling. Okay? And that's because there is no other. There is no character on the screen. It's you. Okay? You're the character. Um, and that lack of distance actually causes us all sorts of trouble. It works against us in eliciting emotional responses. Uh, it's a real problem. Um, we can't make you feel anything. Uh, and we have to make you feel something. Um, but again, that's why we keep coming back to adrenaline rushes uh, or, or intellectual challenges. I mean, there are a lot of those, those are basically the two things that we can do for players. We can give them an intellectual challenge and we can, we can um, uh, you know, make them feel excited and nervous and anxious and stuff. Um, Okay, the character challenge, I mean, you're not going to fall in love with a stick figure, you know. Uh, it's, it's tough enough to fall in love in real life uh, if you can't believe uh, that that bunch of pixels on the screen is a human being. It's going to be very, very hard to feel anything. Um, the way we handle conversations hasn't changed in a decade. Um, you know, character interaction is the worst part of every game ever made, uh, bar none, and that's character interaction is all there is in a, in a game about falling in love. The senses challenge. Okay. Again, I, I don't think I need to, you know, beat this, uh, beat this dead horse. I mean, uh, we just, we have two kinds of things we do, we do sight and sound. Um, you know, sight and sound. Um, okay. Uh, the critical and, and, and unsolvable problem here, I think, is uh, we know the characters on screen aren't real. We know it. Um, and part of the appeal of games is that they're not real, you know? We want players doing stuff. I mean, players want to do stuff in games that, that they, we don't want them doing in the real world. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of cool that, that a cartoon character who falls, you know, down to the, the bottom of a, a canyon, we know that character isn't dead. Um, falseness kills any possibility of feeling any real emotion. Um, and at, at least until virtual characters leap off the screen into our laps, I think it's going to be that way forever. Uh, there's that distance between what's happening on the screen in a game, uh, lack of tools to create empathy, unconvincing characters, bad conversation systems. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why I don't see this changing much. Um, you know? Uh, so we have an unreality challenge. Um, okay, so. How well suited to games is the idea? Well, the answer is not very. <laughs> um, you know, games are, games are about victory conditions. Uh, even in, uh, in Will Wright's sandboxes, there's still points. There's still, you know, how, how does your sim develop? There's still uh, a winning and losing state to some extent. Um, you know, there's, there's just nothing like that. Uh, in a game about love, the ob what, are the, what is the obvious goal of, a, of, of falling in love? Uh, verbs are bad, 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 bad. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the whole idea of making a love story clearly taps into a classic human fantasy. You don't have to convince people they should be interested in falling in love. 
Um, it's a common experience, so everybody's experienced it. Um, it can hurt in reality, so doing it in a virtual space is, has some, some appeal. Those are things we can work with. Um, and then, uh, you know, it is true that, that, that it's never been done before, but, you know, there have been some dating sims. Uh, it, if, if you're into import games, these can be a really trippy experience. Uh, uh, but they're, they're mostly about, you know, like getting a date, not about feeling something. Um, they, they, again, this, is, this was how, like, Raf Cost achieved it. He basically did a dating sim. You know, where the goal is to get a date with a girl or something. That's 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 lame. Um, Eco, you know, Eco did did some really interesting stuff. Um, the the power of, of this. How many people played Eco again? I know I've asked that before. God, you gotta go out and get it, man. It is an amazing little game. It's just a silly puzzle game, but but you know, you've got this character who's kind of weak, the 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 princess here, and she's slow and she's a pain in the neck, and you have to protect her. And you drag her along. You literally, well, you don't literally touch her, but you, you take her hand and you drag her basically through this world. Um, and it's a real shock how, 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 how much of an emotional attachment that creates. Um, so, uh, you know, she's kind of the center of your universe, the reason for your existence. Um, it's not love exactly, but it's disturbingly close. And it makes me think maybe it actually can be done. Um, okay, and this is the goofiest example I know. Uh, but did, did any, any of you guys remember the, the spider bots in, in Invisible War? Okay, fine. Anyway, I'll tell you. Um, th this is the only time in any of the games I've worked on where I actually felt something. You know, I mean, I, and in uh, I've had games where characters died, and you know, there's this beautiful cutscene. I mean, I've played Final Fantasy, and you know, Final Fantasy VII, you know, character dies, and oh my God, it's gut wrenching. Um, but but these little guys right here, we, we purposely made them really stupid. You, they're, you, they're basically, you've got this little bot you can throw down on the ground, and they'll follow you around until you detonate them and blow things up. Okay. Um, and they, so they do your bidding, and they, they really do try to follow you around. But they're really stupid, and their pathfinding is really <laughs> is not good. Um, and we made it that way on purpose. Okay. But there was one spot, I, I encountered this in, in one of my playthroughs, where um, I dropped a spider bot on the ground, and, and it, 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 it started, it, it goes like this. It, it makes this cute little noise, and it's little and cute, and it just tries to get to you. It's constantly trying to get to you. And th it couldn't make it up over this little ledge, like this big. And I was standing on the ledge, because I had to get out of this area. And it, it couldn't make it over. And I spent, I don't even want to tell you how much time I spent trying to find a route for that thing to, to come with me. Um, and, and, you know, that feeling, I, 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 I really did establish an emotional bond with a spider bot. Um, and, and so that also makes me feel like maybe someday we might actually solve the, the, this problem. I, I didn't feel love for the spider bot, just to be clear. Um, but I, I did feel something, you know? Um, similarly, I mean, Grim Fandango, um, you know, this is all about, how many people play Grim Fandango? There you go. Okay. So it's Manny Calavera is this, this character and he, he goes on this, like this quest basically through the underworld to, to be reunited with Mercedes Calamar, you know, the woman he loves. And, um, uh, I watched my wife play this actually. I, I couldn't get near the computer to play this one. Uh, so, so I watched her and she really did establish this an amazing sense of affection for this character. Um, largely because of his devotion to Mercedes. It was amazing. Um, you know, there was never a point where I think my wife felt like she was Manny. Uh, I hope not. Um, but but she, she did feel something, so that's kind of cool. Um, but still, I mean, I don't think anybody's done the game where you actually feel those emotions, where you actually elicit those those responses and all those those you know hormones and everything. Um, so uh, again, I, I think I think we're I already went through this. Um, you know, the player goals are unclear. Uh, the verbs, yeah, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, what can we actually allow the player to do and what responses can we elicit? They're very limited. Um, 
you know, as I started thinking through this, I just started thinking, damn, I wish there was a place for a gun and a love story. Um, <laughs> you know, game verbs have to be active and external, uh, or we have to rethink what the game experience is all about. And, um, you know, I mean, if you look back at the games I described, they've got it something like uh, a love, uh, the feeling of love. The, the, the verbs might be, you know, rescue, I guess, protect, touch, talk. Um, you know, I, I, I could add, you know, stare into a lover's eyes, you know, limpid pools, all that stuff. But our characters suck. So it's like I'd be staring into, you know, 10 pixels and it just wouldn't work. Um, so, the, you know, it's just we don't do emotion well. We don't do characters. We don't do that, I mean, actual physical things well. We don't do interaction well. We know it isn't real. Can't possibly work, you know. Um, we need better characters. Uh, for sure, before anybody should even tackle this, um, you know, uh, if you're going to make a game like this, I think you can focus on, pers on the pursuit, on the, the sort of what steps you go through to fall in love with somebody, and maybe you could come up with something interesting. Uh, we could go through lessons, but um, you're not going to get the feeling of love. You know, you're just not. Um, I'm going to skip over this because I just don't think this is really relevant here. Um, I'm going to skip over that. Okay, so basically I got through all of that stuff and uh, decided it was a really bad idea. And now we actually get to what I really wanted to talk about tonight. So I probably have five minutes, right? 30 minutes. Hey, I might be able to get through. Oh, I can zip through this. Okay, so uh, I decided the love story was a bad idea. I will not try to make one. I will not do it. Um, because I ran through my list of seven questions, and with a couple of exceptions, the answers were all bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. Okay, go. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's, the, yeah, the, there's the, the point that, that people fall in love with animals uh, that, that don't offer anything, but, you know, you can touch them and, and care for them and all that stuff. And that's, that's a really good point. And, and actually, my, since I, I gave um, a, a longer, slower, more thoughtful, better prepared version of this talk, I've actually changed my thinking a little bit. Um, and I actually think that there are opportunities in more iconic, simpler characters to, to elicit uh, deeper emotional responses, actually. I mean, I think if, if we, um, you know, I, I mean, it's, it, I don't know about you guys, but it, it's, there was a, it was a game, what was it called, Creatures, uh, a while back, where you could, it was sort of Tamagotchi-like and really, really pet-like, and I had a hard time turning that game off. Because, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to take care of, the, there was these little cute creatures that you had to take care of, and, and it was, it was, I didn't like the feeling I got when I turned the machine off. I felt guilty. I mean, guilty is not love, okay, but it's, it's feeling something, which is more than I usually feel when I, you know, blow a hole through somebody playing a game or, or you know, take the ladder out of the Sims pool and watch the guy drown or, you know, <laughs> you know that sort of stuff. Come on, you know, you've all done it, right? Um, so I'm, I'm actually thinking that, that simpler, more iconic things can elicit stronger emotions. And that's, oh, that's so cool. Um, that's, I think I said this before, too, and that's one of the reasons why I'm enjoying working with Disney because they don't even, they, I mean, they, they encourage that sort of thinking. You know, you don't have to fight for a, a more iconic, less hyper-real style. Yeah. What does it say to you about the video gaming as a creative medium that you can't touch this <coughs> huge swath, not only of human experience, but also creative outlet? Like, Boy Meets Girl is, you know, responsible for 30% of all swaths in all movies and all that. Um, yeah, uh, what does it tell me that, that we, we can't touch this, this huge swath of human, human emotion uh, and, and, or human beings? Um, you know, it kind of saddens me a little bit. But, but to, be, to be frank, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think we will get to the point where uh, a couple things are going to happen. One is people smarter than me, I mean, next generation of people who've grown up playing games, you know, five years, ten years, twenty years from now, someone is going to figure it out. Someone will figure out how to make you feel 
they'll figure out how to do the verbs that we don't currently know how to do. Okay, and that'll help. Um, I think um, uh, we'll get better characters. We'll get better actors. I mean, one of the things, there's, there's a guy, uh, Ken Perlin, uh, who teaches at NYU. He's a researcher at NYU who's done amazing things with procedural animation, uh, not, not scripted animation, which is very limited in what it can, can provide us. But uh, procedural animation and introduction of, of, of noise into facial expressions and stuff that, that, that is surprisingly powerful. And uh, he's got a demo. Uh, I don't know if it's up on his website, but he's got a demo that's basically a jello cube, just walking. And you can basically tell it, be sad. And this jello cube just sort of goes, hmm, you know, and procedurally, and just moves like a sad jello cube. And be happy, and it does this. And, and again, it's that iconic thing again. It's like if we, if we don't try to pretend that something is real, we can make it more believable in a, in a strange sort of way. Um, but the work he's doing, um, some of which you can see in Half-Life 2. I mean, Ken, Ken did some consulting, at least, with... Uh, with Valve on, on Alex, you know, the character of Alex. And that's like a lot better than what most, most games offer, you know? I mean, Mass Effect look like, looks like it's gonna be offering a little bit more. And so we're getting better. So I think our tools will get better for, for you know, offering more believable characters. I don't care about realistic, but more believable characters. Um, someone will figure out how to do a conversation that isn't just a branching tree. Someone will figure that out. Um, you know, maybe someday we'll have, uh, you know, natural language processing and, and uh, you know, universal knowledge pools that NPCs can draw on and, you know, respond believably to unplanned events, you know. Um, and someone will convince EA to fund something like this, which is the real, you know. Uh, or someone at a university will, you know, realize, hey, wait, I don't have to make money on this. I'll figure this out in, in the, the safe academic setting, safe in air quotes. Um, because boy, the politics here can be deadly. Um, so I, I think ultimately these are solvable problems. I think from a commercial standpoint right now with the tools we have available today, it's just we are, we are a niche medium that overcharges for our product. I've said that before too. You know, we are not a mass medium yet. And it's because we, we don't know how to solve these problems. We can't do boy meets girl yet, you know. Um, and I mean, it's kind of instructive. Uh, when I when I when I talk about this, a lot of people bring up uh, The Sims and Nintendo Dogs and you know how they feel about characters in those in those games. But when you try to take that one step further, when it stops being a game about uh, numbers juggling, you know, and acquisition, which is you know, The Sims is the ultimate shopping simulator, not the ultimate human simulator, right? Um, you know, when it stops being about that, it all just sort of falls apart. There was a, a German company that I, I think it was a German company did. Uh, they tried to turn The Sims into a, a love machine, basically, and it just didn't work. I mean, it just it was laughable, you know. Uh, what's that? Second life. No, second. Li well, Second Life is that. Oh, I'm not getting in the middle of this. You tried to sucker me in there, didn't you? <laughs> um, no, but Second Life does the cop out. I mean, as soon as you're dealing with real people, a lot of these problems go away. I mean, you know, you you put virtual, real people playing virtual, playing avatars in a threatening situation, even if it's a virtually threatening situation, you give them the minimal communication tools and they will find ways to love and hate and, you know, enjoy each other's company uh, and overcome challenges together. They, they'll, they'll find ways. I mean, there's, there are all sorts of um, MMO experiences that I think can get, get at, at some deeper emotion. Um, but again, I, I'm kind of a single player guy. I'm in that box. And for me right now, someone needs to show me a way out of that box. And I don't know what it is. But we'll get, we'll get there eventually. I mean, I'm, I'm really not as negative as I sound. Like I said earlier, I'm pretty hopeful. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, thanks for indulging me. We'll have an, a guest next week. I